we are living in a moment, a moment of high rebellion. What we're seeing in Christian nationalism are Anabaptist tendencies to the extreme. I agree with you. I can tell you that I know that there are hotheads in the movement that I'm associated with. You have a responsibility, just like I have a responsibility, to speak to these things and calm these people down instead of blowtorch things. And I can assure you that I have been doing my level best to deal with the hotheads. What is God's what is God's will? Like, do you have a right to say to God, God, give me Scotland or I die? Are you warranted to even speak in that way? No. Now, so, so, okay, <laughs> no. so now we're getting no. to the nub. We should be on our knees in prayer, and we should be on our knees in tears that these things are happening. I just want you to know that I, I care about you, and um, like I said at the beginning, even if I considered someone an enemy, I'm called to love them. Well, thanks for watching another uh, AGR video cast. Grateful to all our listeners and watchers for uh, taking time to watch another program. Today, we have sort of a special debate, in-studio debate, discussion. And we have with us today, uh, Doug Wilson, who is a pastor at Christ Church in Moscow. How many years, Doug? Oh, my. 40 I started preaching in 1977, whatever that is. 19, it's the year I was born, so. <laughs> so, um, okay. that's, uh, so going on 50 years. Okay. Um, written quite a few books, um, which I've read in preparation, not all of them, but in preparation <laughs> for this. Um, and you're on the faculty at New St. Andrews College? Correct. Okay, great. Um, and Jared, Jared's here with us, Jared Longshore. Uh, grateful to have you here. Uh, Jared, you are the associate pastor at Christ Church in Moscow, correct? Yep, that's right. Okay. That's right. Welcome to you. How many years have you been there? I have been there coming up on three years. Okay. No. Great. Yeah. And you have um, seven children, you seven. told me? Yep, okay. seven children. Wonderful. And uh, also the dean and fellow of theology at New St. Andrews. Okay. Fantastic. And Doug, how many children do you have? I have three children, 18 grandchildren, wow. and three great-grands. Okay. All right. Well, I want to thank you uh, for coming to Escondido. This might make some brains explode. <laughs> but, maybe maybe um, even uh, ours. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> um, I anticipate this being somewhat of a lively discussion um, on some of the issues of our day that have been well, you know, yeah, you're not lively. a stranger to controversy, and um, some of these issues are uh, really affecting Christians right now, thinking through, well, in a, in a changing culture that has changed so radically in, in recent years. To deal with some of those issues, I'd like to address some of that Christ and culture. We'll look some, think about some, and address uh, Federal Vision masculinity more. I don't know how we'll do this in the time allotted, but we're going to give it our best shot. So, Thank um, you for trying. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to try. Um, I want to say up front, um, a lot of these issues are complex. Um, I think that's one challenge for American Christians. We don't like complexity. Mm -hmm. So some of these issues are indeed complex, and we have to think through them carefully. Um, I've done my best to do the reading and to do my best to try to understand them. I've tried to read you as charitably as I can and to mm -hmm. try to understand what you're saying and to do it in such a way that I'm fair with your arguments um, if I'm not that, you, I, I told you up front, you're welcome to say that. Um, right. Many people will question this, I'm sure. I'm really not looking forward to fueling 100 video and podcasts after <laughs> this with content that are going to tear apart every word. Um, but I, as I get older, I really don't care. <laughs> so, <Right>. you know, <laughs> I'm, right. I'm great enough now <laughs> to know not to worry about it, right? right? I guess we care to some degree. But um, there are sides in everything today. And... Um, my fear somewhat is that I'll create, by doing this, more confusion. I don't want that. So we want to help people with clarity on these issues. Um, I'm doing this today for that sole purpose, because I care about these issues, biblically, confessionally. I want to help Christians through this. Uh, this stuff has been weighty on me for many years as a pastor. Uh, it's affected me for many years. Not trying to—I'm kind of giving my direction here, but goals here. I'm not trying to win a debate. I'm, I'm sure, Doug, Jared, there's no question uh, in light of the many places you have been that I'm going to ask that you've not heard before. Yeah. Um, these questions have been uh, asked, I'm sure, many times to you. I do hope to demonstrate that we can have discussions on these things in a way that 
uh, is charitable. We're not in a world that treats people whom we just with whom we disagree with charitably at all. Um, and I, that's one of my goals here to do it respectfully with you. Um, the calling of our Lord, even if I considered somebody to be, even if a radical enemy of the gospel, my call is still to love them. Right. That is a call, right? That is a right. command. So, um, so I'm trying to come at this as respectfully as I can, demonstrating that I'm not afraid to be challenged myself on these issues. Uh, I don't want to avoid these issues with whom I disagree. I've written a piece um, that went out critiquing some of your thoughts, Doug. And I, I, I believe personally that if you're going to critique somebody, you should be willing to engage them. Um, not everyone shares that view, but that's yeah. at least my conviction. Yeah. So thank you for that. Yeah. So here we are. Well, uh, where to begin? We want to begin with something really controversial. Um, let's think about Christian nationalism. <laughs> let's, right. let's, let's start there. It's hard to know uh, where to begin. Uh, I know you've defined it before, Doug. And Jared, um, I've read more of Doug. I know you have some books out. Uh, it's on my list. So forgive me that I'm not as prepared with your writings. So uh, I don't say this in any way to uh, marginalize what you've done. Um, I, I want to engage you too. So anything that I say here is really to both of you. Okay. Right. Very uh, good. Um, <laughs> I know you said it before, I watched the Tucker interview and would you define for us again, a Christian nationalism? Yeah. The Christian nationalism is the recognition that secularism is a failed project. Uh, official state supported agnosticism doesn't work. It was always false, but there were times when the falseness seemed plausible. So if in the late in, in the late in Eisenhower's administration, someone said, we Americans can live decent orderly lives without reference to God, um, I think that that was false then. But at least when you're looking around, it was harder to refute because you're your neighbors on either side took out their trash on the right day and they drove on the right side of the road and everything seemed to be going along fine. But today your neighbors are reading drag queen story hour uh, stories and on the other side, teenage daughter just had a double mastectomy because she thinks she's a guy. Everything, all the wheels have come off. So if, for Americans to say today we can live decent orderly lives without reference to God is radically false. We've okay. killed 60 million babies. We've, um, we've, Obergefell has made same-sex mirage the law of the land. Uh, you can get fired from any major corporation in America for thinking, for saying out loud, I think that little boys ought not to think they're little girls. Mm -hmm. um, so everything is coming unstuck. So the, the first thing is that the, the old gods have failed. The secularist gods have failed. The post-World War II liberal consensus has failed. It doesn't have the, it doesn't have the ability to hold a people together. Um, that's the first part. The second part is, as Christians, we believe that uh, no society can cohere without, a, without an ultimate reference point. And as Christians, we believe that ultimate reference point ought to be the true and living God and not an idol. Okay. Right. That, that, so that in a nutshell would be my understanding. Two, two steps. The old gods have failed. And what I'm proposing instead is a recognition of the true God. And after that, when you get to particular policy proposals, it's a matter of debate and exegesis. But the principle is... Americans should stop making God angry. Okay. Okay. A lot to interact with there. Anything Anything to add, Jared? Um, no, I mean, I, I agree with that explanation. Secularism is dead. We need some kind of transcendent anchor. Um, we acknowledge that we're one nation under God. So you're simply underscoring that. There's a, there's a public civil acknowledgement of the triune God, of the Lordship of Christ. So in some sense, I want to I wanna indicate that it's, it's already been, um, been done, like it's already present. I don't think that um, what's being proposed is out of step or uh, like a revolutionary move, something that's out of step with where our nation has been. Um, but it is in, it, it's an idea in need of renewal, okay. public acknowledgement of the Lordship of Christ. We want to revert to American factory settings. Okay. 
Okay, we're going to discuss that. We're, we're going to discuss that. Um, before I sort of engage some of those ideas, I'm going to run through just to sort of set the trajectory here. A few comments and um, to think about, I'll raise an initial concern, but it's going to be kind of fleshed out as we go. Okay. Um, Stephen Wolf says in Christian, uh, Case for Christian Nationalism, which I've read, Christian nationalism is the totality of national action consisting of civil laws and social customs conducted by a Christian nation as a Christian nation in order to procure for itself both earthly and heavenly good. The Christian nation is the complete image of eternal life on earth. Fair enough? Yeah, I don't differ with that. Well, the complete image, um, as complete as possible in a fallen world. Right. It's, it's not the... Gotcha. It's not beyond yeah. the eschaton, yeah. but as, as complete as may be. Okay. Um, I thought Paul Miller, for some reason, this definition's not sticking for people. <laughs> Stephen's in, Stephen's definition. Well, yeah, it's a. I thought I thought it's it's interesting when people try to define things. Stephen's definition is muddy to me. I mean, I get the basic gist of it. It's not mm-hmm. it's not hard to get the basic gist. I think Paul Miller actually cap- captures it pretty well. I think the uh, religion of American greatness, um, where he says you believe a nation should be Christian and you believe the state should enforce it. What do you think? Well, a nation should be Christian. That's, okay. that's correct. But what part of it should be enforced? Okay. Right? Fair enough. There's right. nuances. So, yeah. um, so the nuances is, is that we would adamantly agree that you can't make Christians, uh, you can't turn people into Christians, genuine Christians, at the point of a sword. Right. Uh, that's, not right. How, that's not how conversions happen. Paul says our weapons are not carnal. They're, but they're mighty. So our weapons aren't, um, it's not, we're not followers of Mao where power grows out of the mm-hmm. barrel of a gun. Yeah, right. But our weapons are mighty for pulling down strongholds. So um, the, you, you can, the issue is not whether laws can make the people Christian. The issue is whether the people can make the laws Christian. Okay. Fair right. enough. Right. Fair enough. Yeah. So okay, right. um, people will say the laws are neither, they, laws don't have an immortal soul and nations don't go to heaven when they die. So how can they be Christian? Well, by that metric, you can't have a Christian college or a Christian bookstore or a Christian, uh, you know. Uh, so, but you can have righteous laws. So you, you could have laws where you didn't arrest people for praying in front of abortion clinics where you didn't allow for the dismemberment of the unborn. That's a righteous law, mm-hmm. right? So it's po- you can't change a sinner's heart with law, um, but you can have a righteous versus an unrighteous law, yeah. and we should do that. So don't the laws don't make the people Christian, but if you have a Christian consensus, as the late Francis Schaeffer said, then that Christian consensus can produce righteous laws. Okay. Um, this is just a comment. This will, I'm going to interact with that as we, as we go here. Um, I, I think the term is inherently ambiguous and confusing for people. Christian nationalism. Yeah. 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 I I don't, I don't, it's not, it's not clicking for some people. It is obviously there's a majority of people. It is, I'm not even sure in the political realm. I think it's losing steam. I'm not hearing that as the sort of main thrust of the campaigning going on. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm tuned out. But it seems that it's an important discussion for Christians, mm-hmm. a very important discussion for Christians. And these things we need to, we need to wrestle through. We need to think through. Um, I, I am concerned at the different shades of Christian nationalism. I think you saw it at the RNC the other night. You know, there's <laughs> there's a masculine man up there tearing off his shirt, Hulk Hogan, which I used to have <laughs> posters of, right? That is um, Christian nationalism. Yeah. So, that's, 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 that's the that's definition it. we were looking for. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, followed by Franklin Graham to come pray, followed by Kid Rock. Didn't he put up the finger? I I don't know. Then there was a Hindu prayer in there. Um, My concern is, this is just initial, we don't have to, we'll let this go, is that it has no resemblance to its historical usage. And um, it actually has, is working against at least historically sort of political theory and free limited government. But um, let me agree with you there. Okay. But that's because in, with any new movement, 
uh, whether you're talking about the Puritans or talking about the Methodists or talking about any movement, it takes time for the thing to set up. And w- what was a Puritan in 1590? Well, mm-hmm. a, uh, the that definition didn't solidify until uh, some decades later. Um, Christian nationalism is <laughs> um, basically uh, a racist is someone who's winning an argument with a liberal, right? So if you are if you advocate for the unborn because you're a Christian pastor, then for the left you're a Christian nationalist. Well, that's true. I mean, right. they're they're using it that way, right? And, and so the that's the boogeyman, epi- yeah, the boogeyman, right? So uh, Meet the Press did a, a a story on the work in Moscow, and did a bunch of reporting and talking to people. And then when I saw the report, it was all about Christian nationalism, and we hadn't used that word once, right? The, the, yeah. That phrase once. Uh, so that what it's it's a it's a term that I can work with. And I think I can explain it in a couple of minutes, as opposed to some of the other things we get called, like white supremacist or theofascist. Or you know, I, I don't want to try to work with those at all. There, there could come a time where Christian nationalism became a useless term because it was taken over by anti-Semites or, or, or th- you know, th- I could say, okay, guys, time to throw that term away. But right now, I think the the, the conditions are ripe. For us to say yes, and let me tell you what I think that means. But I'm aware that there are there are alternative denominations in the Christian nationalist. Um, there's this big thing, and there's the Stephen Wolf contingent. There's the Gab and uh, Andrew Torba, Andrew Isker contingent. There's the Nick Fuentes anti-Semitic. Uh, you know, and they're all saying Christ is King. Christ has to be yeah. Lord of all. There's the Catholic integralists. Uh, so there's a bunch of... Right. And I, I guess, you know, st- I'm worried about bandwagoning a term here that we're hitching our uh, trailer to <laughs> to an elephant here <laughs> that's going to cause us a lot of problems. Um, Good. And I think I think that's a real concern for me. I, th- I personally think the whole term needs to be abandoned. Um, but we'll come back to that. <laughs> okay. Well, good luck. Yeah. So, well, so the the point is, the, the we are not yet in control of terms. Well, that's that's fair. <laughs> right. But we're con, we're in control of how we use terms. Right. Okay. Wilson, there. I'm quoting you, Wilson. <laughs> I'll say yeah. Wilson. All right. There's no neutrality. Jesus is Lord. Secularism is not capable of sustaining limited government. If there's not recognized a recognized God over the state then who has now become God? So that's sort of the premise. That's what you said on Tucker. Um, mm-hmm. Jared, you jump in on this. Um, it's somewhat, to me, a fallacy of a false dilemma. If God is not over the state, um, is God over the state if we have a secular government? So, so in other words, I think you're building into the definition what I believe is a false premise, that we're in this situation that's an either-or. In other words, namely, if Christianity is not in a position of power— um, directing all subjects according to specific Christian principles, the state is illegitimate. No. Okay, but I, that's what that's that's how people are hearing it. So right. that's that's my question first. As you engage that, are you saying that all governments that aren't specifically Christian are you saying they're illegitimate? No. Um, we're told in Scripture that to render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, right? To God the things that are God's. If it has Caesar's image on it, you it's got George Washington's picture on it. It's a quarter. You can send it to Washington. If it's got God's image on it, like your children do, you may not render them to Caesar because you must render them to God, not to Caesar. So you render to Caesar the things that belong to Caesar. And one of the things that does not belong to Caesar is the definition of who is Lord. That's one of the things that doesn't belong to him. So the Bible explicitly says, honor the emperor. <laughs> mm-hmm. And and the emperor at the time was one of history's premier dirtbags. Right? Uh, <laughs> so I guess I didn't <laughs> right, right yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. Pardon. Um, yeah. he, was, he was a bad actor. And Christians were told to honor the emperor. But you honor the emperor the way God says to honor the emperor, not the way the emperor says to honor the emperor. But your, your writings, Doug— 
aren't capturing that for me. Um, what I'm hearing you, I mean, I, in Empires of Dirt, you say, um, essentially, the spirit has been exiled, if so. Um, in other words, speaking of speaking of secularism as a religion. Mm-hmm. Okay. Right. So, um, the, the premise then is, what, I, what I'm having a hard time understanding you, you here say is, if God, if there's not a sort of Christian position of power, then God is not sovereign over the state. That's what I'm hearing from you. Oh, uh, no, God, God is absolutely sovereign all the time, everywhere. Okay. Uh, and when we have secular governments that afflict us the way they do. So does God appoint these leaders and rulers who are not Christian? Um, you're saying they can be legitimately appointed. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, what happens if, what happens if, I mean, it seems to me it's the either or here, if they're pushing secularism, now, is that, could, is that you, still legitimate? You could have a Caesar, like Augustus, who um, emperor worship really took root under Caesar Augustus in Asia Minor, but Augustus had the good manners to be thoroughly embarrassed by it. <laughs> he just, he was just embarrassed by that, and he was doing it for reasons of state, um, but by the time you get to uh, Nero, people like that, they bought in. They thought they were God. And so there's a difference between an unbelieving magistrate, a pagan magistrate, whom God can use and should be honored and followed and obeyed by believers, and someone who becomes a tyrant. So I got that. Okay. I understand that. But but can secularism function correctly if there's no reference to God? If, no, if it's Christian secularism, yes. Okay. Cr- Christian secularism. I understand. So, um, if um, in in the medieval world there were the secular, there were the regular clergy, the monks in the monasteries who lived according to rule, and then the secular clergy were the ones out in, 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 dealing with the hurly burly of life. So there was an older Christian definition of secular. Right. I uh, realize right. it has different meanings in different right. places. So I'm fine with acknowledging that this realm of the civil magistrate ought not to be ecclesiastical. I believe in the separation of church and state. Okay. Okay. Uh, so the state can be secular, and I would argue the state should be secular because it's under Christ. It's not, it's not ecclesiastical. I don't want the boards of, I don't want boards of elders uh, uh, declaring war or deciding how the garbage co- is collected or the, the church and the state must be separate. But I believe it should all, in order to maintain that, I believe it has to be under the authority of Christ. And that might be the difference between a legitimate authority and a, an authority operating correctly. So any kind of secular in the sense of we don't acknowledge the lordship of Christ and we don't acknowledge the triune God, well, you would still be a civil magistrate. You'd still be a governor, city council, county commissioners, mm-hmm. or president, mm-hmm. but you would be the Psalm 2 type, right? You would be the the... the kings of the earth who set themselves and take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. And then it's like the church should be witnessing you need to kiss the sun or it won't go well for you. Okay. So like you can't, it's not going to function. And Augustine toys around with this in the city of God. It's very interesting. He basically says if justice is like the hallmark of a commonwealth, then he says Rome was never a republic. Right? It's just really fascinating the way. And then he pivots and, and gives the idea maybe the essence of the commonwealth would be a people ordered by their loves. So he kind of takes it out of the realm of justice. So he people often yeah, go to right. Augustine to right. cite this very question, is it legitimate? And I want to say, well, yes, you are the civil authority, but you're certainly not going to function well without acknowledging the lordship of Christ. Okay. Um I guess I'm, I'm, I'm con- <laughs> when I read Empires of Dirt, when I read Mere Christendom, that's not the sense I get. Do you I, get the, do you get the sense that we're about ready to man the barricades and declare war? No, I get the sense that y- you've created this either or situation. And I'm going to come to a point here in a minute that I want to develop in light of that. This either or situation that if, um, I, I've, I don't, I don't think we can deny that secularism has religious things happening. It's, it's, it, mm-hmm. it, you can't deny that, right? right. Um, there is a religion going on. I don't deny that. There's a religion happening. Um, but I'm, I'm concerned that I hear this either or, that without reference to God, the state will always become God. That's what I'm hearing you say. Oh, yeah. That's, I am saying that. The state, without okay. reference to God, uh, that's exactly what I'm saying. So if there is no authority above the state. But see, that's the false premise. That's, that's the false dilemma I'm trying to raise here. Okay. 
There's never a situation in which God is not over the state, even no. in those situations. Yeah. But there would be a play, uh, there would be a circumstance in which those civil authorities don't acknowledge him. That, and that's what I mean. If they're in rebellion against him. Right. right. That, uh, sorry, I'm, I can see where I'm tripping you up. Um, if there is no God above the state in the minds of the people running the state, that God's always over the state. There's never a time when God's right. not over the state. So, um, so when I say, if there is no God over the state, in the convictions and operating procedures of the people who are running the state, if they gotcha. do, not, I understand that. Okay, I understand. That. If they don't yeah. recognize, I don't. God, I don't know that people understand that. <laughs> okay, well, that's a, that's an interesting turn that I'll I'll have to start emphasizing that because I don't. I'm a Calvinist. I'm a yeah. Calvinist from top to bottom. Yeah. When you the, went to Tucker, uh, that is not it, it just just me. That was not how I heard it said, okay. and I don't think Tucker walked away hearing it that way. Uh, okay. Um. What I heard is this sort of form, you know, we will always face the worst forms in your language of absolutism. Yeah. Um, I'll come back to that as, as we develop this. Um, I learned that from Francis Schaeffer. Okay. Okay. Maybe I'll raise him in a minute too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Um, and, and, and I guess this is, you know, it seems like we as Christians are just desperate to get Jesus's name in the public square. I think you saw it with the Iowa debacle. It's like, you know, the guy goes down, knocks down a shrine. Everyone goes ballistic for about two minutes. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, as long as we're saying, as if this is sort of magical, Jesus is Lord, this is exactly what we want. Wolf even talks about all this stuff as sort of preparatory. He, he goes into much more detail than that, much more development than that. But my point is, it's like, put up the poster, Jesus is Lord, we say it, we still have the problem of nominalism, <laughs> yeah. but but it, it seems like that's the sort of thing that we're using God's name. I, I, Philistines are backed up. Uh, Philistines are backing up Israel, and hey, throw the ark out in the middle of the field. Jesus is Lord, and mm -hmm. we're gonna we're gonna win. And they learned a hard lesson. Right. Um, God's God will not be used this way. God God will not be manipulated this way. And I I I fear well, sometimes that. he will be. Okay. Sometimes, sometimes you will be. So when <laughs> when the Ark of the Covenant was taken out uh, to battle, God's, God still spanked them. God, God is so, always sovereign. But there are many times in the Old Testament where the people turned away to idols, got themselves in a bad jam. They were afflicted by the Midianites, and they cried out to, the, to God. Yeah. And many times God heard them. Well, those are prayers of faith. Yeah, that's what we're calling for. Yeah, well, we're, I understand uh, that, but I don't— not calling, We're not calling for— Hey, let's let's do a. Um, uh, th there is this there is this perception. I I don't know if it was Reno, Rusty Reno, in his book. He talks about sort of using even a general name of God that that's more healthy for society. And I don't see how you're not going to promote some enforced idolatry. I'm going to come back to that too. But okay, let's keep going. <laughs> that's Rust, is that the Strong God's book? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I want to live in a baptized civilization. That's what I, um, this is what I mean by mere Christendom. Okay, you say, either Jesus wants this or he doesn't. If he does, then, they, um, then are they not advocating a civil arrangement based on the will of the Lord, which would be a theocracy? Okay. Um, that's where I think we need to think about what we're, what we're truly pursuing here, but I'll come back to that. What happens when an Islamic state forms as a result of democratic process? Here are the options. Here are the options. Jesus doesn't care whether the nations are explicitly Christian, number one. Number two, Jesus is opposed to the nations being explicitly Christian. Or number three, Jesus wants the nations to be explicit. I'm assuming you're number three, okay? Um, so once, this is all I hear in this discussion. This is what we want. This is what we want. No, this what is what Jesus wants. Yeah, okay, well, I'm gonna that, that's good. <laughs> Does he have a wish that's not fulfilled? Well, it, we're talking about whether it's his decretal will or his perceptive exactly. will. Exactly, right, right. right. His, his decretal will, everything, everything God wants is what comes to pass. But then in Thessalonians, the, Paul says, this is God's will concerning you that you avoid sexual immorality. And as every pastor can tell you, there are people in their congregations who violate the will of God. Right. But I want to know if this is, this is prescriptive that Jesus, that Jesus doesn't just want this. He's prescribed this. Right. Well, um, I was laying there, it was options. Either Jesus doesn't care preceptively what we do, or he's opposed to it preceptively. Thou shalt not do that. Or he requires it. 
Those are the logical options. Right. So two, two opposed kind of presupposes that this subject is just to the whims of providence outside when it happens. No, that's the doesn't, he doesn't care. If Jesus is opposed to it, then we should be opposed to it. Okay. If Jesus doesn't care, then that gives me liberty to care myself. Right. So if it's not, if he, it's not that he doesn't care, wrong premise, right? We're we're deists every square inch, <laughs> right. Right. you know, we're not deists every square inch. So, so coming back to three, you know, I, I'm getting, I'm getting at the issue of commandment here. Uh, I'm getting at the issue of precept here. I, I want to know more than what Jesus wants. Like, I understand the distinction you made. I, I understand we don't have access to Deuteronomy 29, 29. I, I understand that. I'm struggling with what is commanded here. I think it's the great commission, disciple the nations. Uh, that's I, th- I I believe that the bringing the nations to Christ, tribes, nation states, all fumes of all forms of human organization. I believe the Great Commission requires us to bring them to Christ. The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our God and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. I look forward to coming back to that verse too. <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah. I have that on my notes, especially with you, Jared, because I heard you on a podcast. Yeah, I, mean, I, yeah, I want to tackle that one soon. Okay, Revelation. All right, Psalm two, Matthew twenty-eight. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we think it's commanded. Okay. You have three sort of options. I still haven't. I still haven't moved to what I want to develop in light of that question here. Um, mm-hmm. I have a hard time because I don't know if I want to just jump into everything I want to, or I want to follow like a course here of development. And hopefully by the end, the listener will say, okay, well, at least they got to it, right? right. Um, you kind of have three options. You have pluralism as one option Christians could find themselves in, right? Um, our situation full of pagans right down the street here. I got the, the Buddhist temple right here last Saturday. I've got the Congregational Church doing Gay Pride Day, mm-hmm. and then you got the Escondido United Reformed Church preaching Reformed doctrine. <laughs> okay, yeah. so um, you have pluralism; it's one situation. You got persecution as another situation. It's a mixed bag in history. I don't really want persecution. Right. I'm not asking for persecution. Um, the church has flourished in amazing ways during times of persecution, um, but the church has also been crushed in terrible ways in times of persecution. Mm-hmm. So. Um, and, you know, and and you think about power then as the third option. Um, that's what I hear you ad- advancing. No. So. Well, um, well. I was second the no. Okay. Is, uh, All right. Persecution, yeah. no. persecution, pluralism, and power. So what about pluralism? Is that a bad thing? Yes. A bad situation for it's us? It's a bad thing. Yes. Okay. So not persecution. So what are the other options? Well, the, the, the options would be the kind of power you could go. Uh, when you say power in the third option, it's sort of a top-down, this is the way uh, shape up everybody. We're The Christian sheriff is in town. Yeah, but, right. Uh, okay, but, and I know uh, you're not, you said that on Tucker, you're not pushing, you're pushing for more of a bottom-up, although you and Stephen are different on that. And we, so I think ultimately we don't because some of the guys in Stephen's orbit grant that a, a Christian prince, a civil magistrate who wanted to start doing, making reforms in a Christian uh, way, he's going to be absolutely hamstrung after um, after just a few days, unless there's a Christian consensus from the people. Uh, the, the people have got to be willing to be led that direction. It's, it's just yeah, not— Yeah, I mean, you, you, so you, you agree with the majority rules principle, I, well, I, and, and that a common con, there should be a common sort of— Well, not as, a doctor, not as a doctrine. Uh, I agree with it as a— practical matter of fact. Okay. So um, I, I believe that if you had an extremely docile group of people who weren't really, um, didn't care much one way or another, and a Christian prince, he should do as much as he could get away with, whether a majority would have voted for it or not. But as a practical matter, I don't believe reforms can be instituted without significant buy-in from the people. So that means out of the three options, it's church planting it's evangelism, it's discipleship. So Build, nothing different than we're doing right now. Nothing different than we're doing right I, I now. Think, I think it needs to be accented, Doug. I'm not, Wait, yeah, I, uh, I, I don't think people are hearing you that way. <laughs> uh, italicize it, italicize it. But with not just marking time, where we're doing it this way with a, well, this is where we're coming from, with a post-millennial vision 
Yes, the, the I look forward to that in a minute. Okay, <laughs> that's the P. It's not power. It's post post all right, all right, all right. We'll take your P, and I'll I'll raise you. Hold on. <laughs> all right. So we we're playing raise this you. game. Okay. We're we're playing the game the same way that you are. We're, we're preaching the word, administering the sacraments, teaching people to live Christian lives. We're doing the same thing. We believe that this is going to have an impact long term, and that we're going to win. We believe that we I win. Know, I know that's the postmillennial position. Right. So I, and I it's believe super we're gonna, fun. I believe, it's super fun. <laughs> I believe we're going to win too. But the problem is, I believe we're already winning. But I'll come back to that thought too. All that's right. not a hey, problem. Hey. <laughs> not agree. A problem. We it's agree. Not it's not a problem. All right. <laughs> totally agree. So, um, yeah, I am a optimistic on mill, okay. very optimistic on mill. So, cool. all right. Um, question is, has God provided, Jared? I, I want to make sure I include you in this because I don't want you to feel like I'm just going after Doug here. Um, That's good. That's good. I'll okay. play my role. You yeah. right. Does God provide a common order where government authorities or, or government authorities are left to his providential discretion? In other words, let's talk about natural law, common grace, just for a minute. Okay. It's not the issue of providence. Here's my big problem with what I'm reading. All over the book, Mere Christendom, Empires of Dirt, there's no doctrine of common grace. I'm not reading it. I'm not hearing it referenced. Um, that's a big problem for me in these either-or discussions. If, you, if you're not presenting any doctrine of common grace, you can see why we would land in reading you as this either-or mm -hmm. situation. Secularism's evil. They're serving another God. Therefore, theocratic arrangement is the only answer. Th that's how we're reading you, okay. okay? I believe yours is a little more warmed over theonomy than the theonomy of a half century ago, maybe. Right. Um, especially when it comes to blasphemy laws, which I found interesting. See, yeah. I've read you. So, Thank you. Um, <clears throat> you say secularism is relativistic of necessity. Because all societies reflect the nature and attributes of their God. Whatever comes into his head becomes law. Hmm. Okay. The God of the system is the final appeal. Mm -hmm. Okay. I heard you say that earlier. Whatever comes into his head becomes law. Let's talk about common grace then. Does the Noahic covenant have any place? Um, does it legitimize common governments, and give them divine authorization, does it have an effect of preserving nature? Yes. Yes, yes. Okay. Yes to all. Okay. I'm not, not reading that in you. So, right. so, so Noah, Noah has this arrangement, Genesis 9. You see the familial institution picked up from, you know, now that the fall has taken place, now it sends in the picture, him reemphasizing certain things. There's no priestly function there. Mm -hmm. I don't see it. I don't see a priestly function in the Noahic covenant that, and this is where Wolf, I think, goes. Well, they offer, he offers sacrifice. Yeah, but it, it, that's, that's the continuing of the covenant of grace. His faith is not separate. It's not left at the door. But the covenant of grace has a priestly aspect. Yeah, but the, the Noahic covenant does not itself. I think what happens in Genesis 6, as opposed to Genesis 9, something fundamental is being done there because you have it made with all flesh. All flesh is not made the covenant of grace with. Right. Okay, so all flesh. Covenant of common grace. Okay, very very good. All right, we're, we're making some progress here. I do. Um, so basically, that, but, the absence that you're seeing, or, and I think you're right, to, to recognize that I don't write a lot about common grace, but that's simply a matter of emphasis and what I'm talking about. It's, I don't differ with the, the historic Reformed view of common grace at all. Yeah, but Doug, if you're going to engage these things, and I'm reading— and I, I, I think I'm a pretty ca fairly careful reader mm -hmm. on these things. And I'm reading, I'm reading secularism as a God. I'm reading the either or situation. I'm reading theonomic post mill thrust in the whole thing. Um, it's a pretty big deal to speak about common grace because, well, under the doctrine of providence and a reformed history, this was a major place for people. So you have these, you know, you have the family institution. You have um, you have the uh, sort of enterprise of the Lex Talionis built into it, mm -hmm. right? That's important, right? Yeah. That's built in. Um, so when you say whatever comes into his head becomes law, um, 
and you're saying that there is a doctrine of common grace, then it seems by necessity you're affirming that there that they can rule in a way that honors the very the moral law, which is built into you know natural law, moral law connection, that they're going to do those things by nature written in the law. It doesn't necessarily follow then, Doug, that that it it necessarily means that every law that comes into his head, right, um, is going to be... So I'm, write, I'm, writing, I'm writing these books, Empires of Dirt, Mere Christendom. I'm writing in a moment of high rebellion against right. heaven. Gotcha. So uh, if, I were, if I were writing in Kuiper's day, or if I were writing at the time of the Reformation, up was still up and down was still down. The Roman Catholics and the Reformed agreed that a girl was a girl and a boy was a boy. Sure. Um, so there were there were l- large elements of operative common grace, and I remember that when I was a boy, there were large swaths of common grace. Up was up, and down was down. Black was black, and white was white. Um, but we are living in a moment where uh, we are shaking our fist at heaven. It is a moment of high rebellion, and when I talk about them enforcing whatever comes into their head. I'm talking about clown world. I'm not, I'm not talking about um, how Dwight Eisenhower would make a law and pass. A, I, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the, the I think that should be nuanced than more for I'm, people. I would be happy that's, to. That's not clear for me. Okay. I'm talking about the moment Thelma and Louise go off the cliff in the car. Okay. So, <laughs> So you would agree. <laughs> a movie I have not seen, but I've seen that scene. <laughs> so God has a, this is a CRC Synod 1924. God has a favorable attitude toward humanity in general. There's a certain favor or grace of God, which he shows to all his creatures in general. God restrains sin in the life of individual man and in the community. There's a restraint of sin, according to scripture in the confession, by the general operations of the spirit, as he restrains the unimpeded breaking out of sin by which human life and society is made possible. Right. Second use of the law is another category here. Civil righteousness as performed by the unregenerate, they can do civil good. Do you agree with those categories? Absolutely. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm currently reading Van Til's book, Common Grace, right now. Um, that's one of the books I'm working, working my way through. Um, and I agree with all those categories, but there's an additional category. God restrains unless it is time for judgment. And in Romans 1, God, uh, what is the wrath of God? Therefore, God gave them up. So they're in, in, the, in, the, cyclic, uh, in the cyclic patterns of human history. There are times when God does all of those things where he restrains evil. and mm-hmm. But then there are times when God to punish a very wicked and impudent people, lets them go, and they run headlong. And that's where we are right now. Okay, let me read in light of that. Um, let me read in light of that, Belgic 13. I'll read Canons 3, 4, 4, and Belgic 13. Would Jared jump in on this? Um, there's a certain light of nature no thief likes to be stolen from, right? <laughs> um, by which he retains some notion about God, natural things, and the difference between what is moral and immoral, and demonstrates a certain eagerness for virtue and for good outward behavior, though he doesn't use it always rightly. They, they have, it's a balanced presentation there. But this is where, in light of what Doug just said, on Providence in Belgic 13, God leads and governs all things. Nothing happens apart from his orderly arrangement, for his power and goodness are so great and incomprehensible that he arranges and does his work very well, even when the devils and wicked men act unjustly. Okay, you might say we're, this, this time we're in is waxed this way. We're in this period of judgment. Certainly, certainly the spirit of the Antichrist has risen up. Certainly there's things happen that are like that. But notice this, that it says God leads all things well in his orderly arrangement, does his work well, even when you have the most wicked and perverse things happening. Amen. Okay. Right. We should not inquire with undue curiosity into what he does that surpasses human understanding, but in all humility and reverence, we adore the just judgments of God, which are hidden from us, being content to be Christ's disciples, so as to learn only what he shows us in his word without going beyond human limits. This whole effort of Christian nationalism seems to say, things aren't going well for us. How's it, how's it going? Things aren't going well for us. 
We've got to do everything we can to put the halts on the secular religionists. We've got to do everything we can to stop. And and how are we not prying into the just judgments of God and his providence and even his decrees to try to stop something that God has ordained and that he will use, Romans 8, for the good of those his elect? Um, it's interesting. I, let me grant something that you didn't quite say, but basically is in the ballpark. There are going to be people that want to try to do this externally. There are going to be people that want to try to do this. And by externally, I should clarify, I mean, not by faith. There are people who are going to be worried, fretful, um, and, and then is working against the providence of God in, or in some, trying, some way to exert themselves as if they want to be God. Trying to defend themselves from God's decrees. Yeah, I, I do think that that's a thing to watch out for. Thank you. I mean, that's, that's a big thing to watch yeah, out for. Yeah, but, but, but here's the key. Like the, now, the, the way you worded everything before about, hey, the world's going to hell in a handbasket here. We are manifestly in a Romans 1 situation. I don't think there's any way to deny that people are beginning to worship the creature. They've turned their back on the creator, and God is giving them over to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. And that is his providence, and that is good, that he's giving them over to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. But hold back those who are stumbling to the slaughter kind of thing. You can do that in faith, right? Um, so the thing, I, the danger on the other side of the road are the people that aren't distinguishing between, between God's decree and God's prescriptive will. Uh, you don't want to say, well, you know, since God's giving this nation over to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done, I, somebody could make this mistake. I'm not saying you you were implying this, but somebody could go, well, I don't want to get in the way of God's decree, so I won't go and take a stand and speak no, the truth. And that's whatnot. exactly right. The question is, is what has he ordered for us as Christians and the church to do? That's what is we're going to uh, So going to the motive, I agree with you completely that I must not say Caesar's being wicked oh, no, I'm in trouble. I better fight. Okay. I, what I want to do is see Caesar's being wicked. Oh, no, Caesar's in trouble. I've got to fight. Now you're making me jump ahead because I think this is such an important point. Um, and I, I, would, I, I would underscore, that's a good way of putting it. I mean, I know, I know um, someone can post something that's crazy and wretched and then say something like, you will be made to care. Yeah. Okay. Yes, you're pulling on people's like, you know what I mean? And even someone who claims that might say, well, I mean it in faith and you need to care in faith. But my, there are tremors of um, people being anxious, people being fretful, which is going to cause all kinds of problems. It really is thrown back, Chris, on what you were saying. What What are we actually to expect from the Lord? And this whole, you know, Romans 13, what does it mean that they're ministers of God? What does it mean that they're servants of God? Uh, and what does it mean that servants need to obey their masters, the Psalm 2? It's it's really back but you, to but what we're expecting. Exactly. Your premise is, this is, and I've heard Doug say it, the premise here is, this is ours. The public square is ours to take back. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, prove that. I don't, I, I, in other words, you know, I don't see how the public squares are to take back for our purposes in light of Belgic 13. Well, God uh, decrees it is. Jesus is Lord in the midst of his enemies, ruling in the midst of his enemies, even when everything's falling apart. Um, I guess what I'm trying to say is common grace. We, okay, we've established, I appreciate your saying there's common grace. I'd like to see more from you on that. I don't think I'm seeing that. Common yeah. grace is not secularism. So, you know, Doug, you say everything, everything, we're having terrible things happen in society. I agree. Uh, they are the just judgments of God, what's happening. We should be on our knees in prayer, and we should be on our knees in tears that these things are happening. Take the Olympics yesterday. What a terrible display, right? <laughs> the, the, um, the confusion of Christians is you got them all riled up. Right. You may take the long 500-year view, which I'm going to come down to you, you back to. You, you may take this long view. You've got everyone worked up that we got to do this in five minutes. And that's what I see everywhere. These people are so worked up. They're angry. They're frustrated. They're, 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 they're being absolutely obnoxious in Christian witness. It's created a whole culture of what I think Paul Miller is right. It's created a whole culture of a tribal identity group, just another one in the mix that's angry. Okay, this is, this is, this is, I'm glad you brought this up because 
one, I don't think that the Christian nationalists, broadly speaking, are to blame for for people getting riled up and trying to solve it in a day. It's Big John in your second grade girl's bathroom that's got everybody riled up about what's happening. And your, um, but your point, I you said rule thou. In no, the it's more than that. <laughs> well, well, okay. Well, what's what that. the Christian communities have having to work out now is what are we supposed to do now? I think there are two bad options. The first option is the one you're pointing against and pushing against, and rightly so. If you're fretting, you know, biting your fingernails and watching another episode of Fox News or the Daily Wire or the Olympics in Paris, and you're fretful and you're not actually engaged in spiritual disciplines and the health of your family and the worship of the church, that's bad. But the other bad option is to actually not engage in this moment and think about what the Lordship of Christ actually is going to mean sure. as the kingdom yeah. of God comes on earth as it is in heaven. Yeah. Particularly this this Psalm 110, you said rule in the midst of your enemies. The very next verse of that is, thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power, mm-hmm. in the beauties of holiness. Okay, so you're supposed to offer yourself freely. All, all of all, we want to call the saints as pastors to offer themselves freely in the day of Christ's power. Which, of course, Acts one eight, like the day of Christ's power has come, and you need to offer yourselves in holiness. But I mean, the text goes on and on. The the Lord has sworn, will not repent. You're a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. You shall strike through kings on the day of His wrath. So the whole vision of that that particular text is the reign of the priest king the advancement of his of his purposes and that's um that's where i think if we it's either going to be fretfulness on the one hand fretfulness and fear and losing your mind or it would be retreatism on the other hand some let, kind let of, me add something to that because I, there's an important point you're making that i do agree with because i've been around in different places in the country and in the evangelical world which is been poorly taught, poorly equipped. They don't have the resources. All they have is Bruno and the girls' showers, and and they're freaking out. If I were a Machiavellian, I could build a huge website catering to evangelicals that was just fear porn. You know, oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no. Um, and, yeah, I mean that's that's one of my main concerns here. Okay, um, but li- but let me um, sh- share the concern and point to something. Um, in, in Moscow, where we've been working at building a Christian community for decades, the demeanor is 180 degrees out from that. Uh, we have happy families. It's characterized by psalm singing. It's characterized by feasting, by joy, by fa- Sabbath dinners, by exuberant worship on the Lord's Day. Reading Herodotus. Um, a liberal arts education. So basically, if, if you drew a caricature of an uh, evangelical couple that go to a big box evangelical uh, store, but the uh, uh, church, but the store, um, but they don't like what they see in the news, and they're susceptible to the fear porn, and they and they react to it, they react to it, they react to it. I know what you're talking about, and that's not what we're doing. Yeah, but your writing, your writings, and the writings of others are doing that. So, well, so I don't think so. Because well, I, I'm going to quote. Let me quote. Let me quote here. Okay, Toby. Let me quote Toby for a minute. Our culture, the Christian West, what is left of it, is in the last gasping hours of stage four terminal cancer. Secularism has metastasized, and it's all in our organs and lymph nodes. Um, and then he goes. So, if anything, we're not pugnacious enough. We're not fierce enough. And if I Quoted Ben Crenshaw here, which you gave, um, you gave another one. I want to see a return to political Protestantism that can rule a nation wisely through civil law, fashion, rhetoric, technology, and more. Alternative cultural movements are fine for now, but at some point, Christians in America will have to get comfortable with coming, becoming explicitly political again, and taking the reins of power in Washington. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. Okay, so you'll have to convince me here. That's my mission as a Christian. I still haven't followed through. I'm already jumping down. But there's nothing you guys like, you know, killing cancer with a little civil war. That's the language. <laughs> so, so come on. I mean, this is the kind of rhetoric that's stirring up everyone. Now, you may have... You may have joyful families in Moscow, but don't you think, you guys, that the perception is we're putting all this writing out there, we're sort of the spearheads of the defenders, uh, you've been known as the most controversial pastor in America, 
by <laughs> Tucker, um, that that essentially that this is a sort of implicit call. We have the answers in Moscow to the problems that are happening. And you give this great perception out there, catastrophic post-millennialism. I think that's the Rush Dooney position. A catastrophic post-millennialism is going to happen. We're almost there. Get on board now. You've stirred everyone up this way. That's what really concerns it's me. It's a catastrophe to use, <coughs> to use Tolkien's phrase. It's, things are really dire. They really are. And you're, you're right to point to uh, our rhetoric is combative. We do challenge. We do, uh, do that's all true, and I wouldn't want to back away from it. But I, I'm in a privileged position in that when people move to Moscow, as many people do, or when I travel and I meet people who've been reading me for years, and I, I gauge what kind of people they are, uh, what, what sort of Christian likes what I do. You know, uh, what, what sort of Christian tracks with what I do? And there are people who, uh, who move to Moscow and who are disappointed and disgruntled and leave. Um, but overwhelmingly, the people who are responding to our messaging, if you wanted to put it that way, are sane, clothed and sane and in their right minds. They're, 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 they're not crazy. This is important. I would, I, I, I want to understand. underscore, I've been, I've been in Moscow for you know, almost three years now. And, um, you know, I've come out of a world of evangelicalism that actually is quite susceptible, like extremely susceptible to the thing that you're talking about. Very susceptible, conservative, Evangelical I actually wrote a piece on this, uh, three, like three communities that you can be involved in. I said separatist pietism will be one community. Defensive evangelicalism will be your second community. And the third would be some kind of reformed Kuyperianism deal. So there is absolutely a defensive evangelical movement that is going to be quick to jump on the Trump train and quick to look for some kind of political solution. We've actually been repeatedly saying there is no political solution. I think you have a a message coming up and I've already said that publicly several times, but I, um, this is why this one's so important because there is a huge problem on the other end of a separatist pietism position that in what happens in that movement, the people that go separatist pietism, they are deeply disturbed. And I think very susceptible to flopping over to the defensive position. What has to be worked out is a, a healthy approach to what it means, what the Lord's prayer means. The Lord, your will be done, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And my, I, I really would say I, Moscow is clearly communicating something on that message that has people going, hey, that's they don't seem to be too, you know, flustered by what's going on. There's joy and there's hospitality and there's, I, I mentioned Herodotus when Doug was mentioning all the things in, in a say, I had a New York, um, a, a journalist from New York Times come out and they're doing like these weird prepper communities and they wanted to talk to us. And as soon as the lady showed up, she's like, it's very interesting. You all are right here in the middle of the town. Everybody seems to be clothed in their right mind. I said, yeah, you know, you can't read Herodotus if you're worked up. Like, it's just not going to work, right? <laughs> Too big. Of, like, the, you, there's no way. And so I think there's actually, you're onto something, but I do think Moscow has something going there. Stick a pin in that as an area where we actually agree. Okay. Um, so. Yeah. I mean, Wolf, how's the loss of cultural Christianity going for you? How much effort and time do you and your Christian friends devote to protecting yourselves and your children and grandchildren? How much space in your church bookshop is taken up with resources to resist the evil in modern secular life? The absence of cultural Christianity has brought hostility, not neutrality. Okay, I, um, how is it? How's it going for you? I, I was never promised it's going to go well in this life. So the premises here deeply trouble me, as if these things. These things in, I'm going to come back to suffering in a minute, but no, but think about this. This is coming back to Moscow. You guys are in red state Moscow, yeah. red state Idaho, you know. Um, you, you've said, Doug, Escondido needs a shot. Well, I won't say where, but you, you've said this um, about us. Okay. Um, Escondido gets pegged. <laughs> Anyways, okay. Um, right. Here I sit in a blue state. Here I sit with lots of tax collectors and centers around me. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying you don't have tax collectors and centers. And yeah, we that. do. You understand yeah. that. Um, you know, when I made the call, when I took the call to come here years ago, I left the sort of 
Christendom project in, in the town I was in, where the whole thing ostensibly had Reformed churches everywhere, kind of Barnhouse's ideal city. Everyone, mm-hmm. Everyone's in church on Sunday. Blue Laws, when I first got there, still existed. Mm-hmm. Um, and everyone morally upright. Okay, everyone, I guess, seemed happy. I was really struggling when I came back to California because I thought, do I really want to go back to that mess? Mm-hmm. Sometimes I feel like you guys are chucking them from the cheap seats. <laughs> here I am. Here I am. I decided to come back to this place. Bad taxes. I can barely afford to live. Um, mm-hmm. I, I'm subject to all kinds of things. My children are sitting here and, you know, I don't see this on the ground in my neighborhood. Right. So, okay. That's another factor to this that, you know, we have a lot of elites pushing stuff in institutional systems and power, pushing power that way. Um, our constitution, you know, I think, I think, um, what's his name? Miles Smith makes a great case that, um, the disestablishment of the constitution did not assume, uh, a sort of secularism by the framers, but that actually they knew that through institutions, things would remain Christian. That's his thesis. So, okay. That being said, what we have is an institutional problem. Get it. I have a Christian school here in Escondido. Um, when I left Linden, Washington, I did not want to come. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was scared to death. And a pastor said to me, I said, it's safe here. Said, yeah, riding your bike. Right. It's not safe spiritually. So what do you mean? Mm-hmm. It is not safe here spiritually. This was the most Christianized town I'd ever seen. It whips Moscow, by the yeah. way. And um, I, come, I come back here into pagan land, and my kids have flourished. Mm-hmm. So I don't, I don't have this panic. Now, granted, I have a community. We build a community. It's a wonderful mm-hmm. community. But I'm not in this panic mode, and I think this is the kind of perspective Christians need to have through this. I, I realize that you've granted this to me. I realize that you said you, you agree with me on this. But I think this is important to note. Um, we have a calling in this life, um, in our mission as Christians in the culture, and our calling to be witnesses to the ends of the earth with the gospel. I, don't, I think this rhetoric is not helping our mission. That's what I'm going to come back to at the end, but that's just an initial comment just to kind of respond to what you're saying. Right. We don't believe that every Christian is called to the same spot or to the same station. So um, God's calling you here and you flourished here. God bless you. Um, there, God calls some Christians to flee California, move to Texas. God calls uh, some people to minister in Idaho he calls some people to to minister in complacent Dutch reformed towns, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, where that need to be shook up. Mm-hmm. Right? The, 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 if God calls him, um, someone to minister any particular place, he's going to have to play the ball as it lays. So when you come to pagan wor- pagan world, you're going to have to approach the problem very differently mm-hmm. uh, than someone who is in a nominal Christian land um, where. The, like if you go back to Kuiper's day, Van Prinster and Kuiper in the Netherlands, uh, a, lot of, a lot of the Dutch fled to America because they weren't allowed to build evangelical Christian schools by the Reformed Christian government. <laughs> so mm-hmm. so they, um, they were persecuted by fellow Reformed Christians, and so they fled to America. So there's always, there's always somebody up to something. And, and whenever you, if you have... Christian consensus. When you enroll in a math class, you're going to have math problems. When you have lots of Christians, you're going to have lots of Christians problem problems. When you have a lot of pagans, you're going to have a lot of pagan problems. God calls us to different stations, duty stations. And just one other point of like unity on this. It's very, as you talked about, you come to California, it's a liberal place and you mentioned, but you built quite a community here mm-hmm. and that's evident just kind of looking mm-hmm. around I can't help. So you but can't see. criticize Escondido too much. Well, oh, no, we're only returning fire. <laughs> <laughs> I can't help but uh, look at parallels, right? So um, Moscow is obviously a very blue dot in the midst of a red state. So, but it's very blue. Um, of my five neighbors, four of them have LGBTQ signs in the yard, right, right, right in front of the yard. 
Doug can't walk down Main Street without getting cussed out and like and flicked off. So there, there's like, but what's happened is we built. There's quite a community that's built up, and it's very similar. I mean, it's the way the church always is. I just mark that as a point of unity. There will always be. Um, the people of God, a, a Goshen-like blessing of God amidst, you know, a darkness. Maybe the question, maybe the 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 debate or the the difference is thinking about how who's going to kind of push against who and who's going to win o- overall. But I just point out there there is actually a similarity. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about. I think I'm going to move down. Maybe this will come back. But you know, I think it was Gabe interviewing Paul Miller was talking about, Oh, I think it was, um, I think it was about a situation in San, in San Francisco. Don't you want God's, uh, so don't you want society ruled according to God's law? I think that's the sort of fallacy of false dilemma that I, I worry about. Um, I think it's important just for me to say, I'm not going to, I don't want to get in a big, we're going to come back to this again, but I want to say this, that it is important that we believe that society, because there is a moral law of God, that society itself, Christians, as they exercise being Christians and influencing institutions and uh, influencing people with their convictions, we we want societally ordered morally. I think yeah. I want I want to say that because I don't. I think sometimes, at least from the Escondido side. You know, David Van Drunen, uh, uh, Kuiper Spear Sovereignty, right? Um, I, I believe, I, I think he was brilliant. I like his Spear Sovereignty. I think it's important. He does say some things I'll read here in a moment. But that Spear Sovereignty each has its own place. I worry of, again, I worry about the theonomic vision of postmillennialism. We're Kuiperians. Okay. But you're, you're theonomic. Well, and Kuiperian. Yeah, that's not, that's not. Totally consistent, Kuiperian. <laughs> well, but anyways. We, uh, so basically, we are not card-carrying Reconstructionists <coughs> from the 80s. I, I, back in the 80s, I read a boatload of Rashtuni and Bonson and North and uh, others and learned a lot from them. But I'm not a card-carrying Reconstructionist. And I am, uh, uh, I am Kuiperian. So I don't believe, I don't believe in uh, a Reformed version of Iran's Ayatollahs, uh, I believe in uh, I believe in sphere sovereignty. I believe in the lordship of Christ overall, but I believe it is decentralized. There's separation of church and state. There are also separation of other lesser yeah. spheres, schools, and whatnot. So I'm I'm happy with the Kuiperian label. I wouldn't agree with everything Kuiper wrote, but I'm I'm basically yeah, a Kuiperian. Well, unfortunately, Wolf's not. Well, yeah, Wolf is a Thomist, and, yeah. and um, he 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 doesn't seem to grasp this the, the the importance of that separation in terms of the sovereignty of each spear. Right, that's definitely going on. And I just add here as everybody's gaming out the positions, and and Wolf and the, that crew is also nowhere near a card carrying Reconstructionist the, theonomist. They're they're very they're very opposed to the card carrying Reconstruction theonomist. So. There's just a lot going on, and that's part of what I meant by this. This movement has not t- cohered; is it's not taken shape yet. So there are um, we're not at war with each other, but there are differences and debates and discussions. And what Stephen Wolf do, wants to do is return to sort of the magisterial reformed political theory, um, wow. Al- Althusius and those guys. Um, and I think that basically theonomy. If you imposed theonomy. And then added 500 years of lived experience, you would have Althusius. So I'm I'm not a full tilt Reconstructionist theonomist. I'm not a full tilt. Uh, I'm not a Thomist at all. Yeah, and a lot uh, of a lot of people are well, the hardcore theonomists aren't real happy with you. So. Right. I, I, um, we know. So, <laughs> but, so right, but we are right in the juicy middle, right in the the okay. right the right position. And we stand on the yellow line. <laughs> yeah. Extremism is to our right and left. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> Truth is somewhere in the middle. Um, okay, I just want to raise this. I know, you know, in light of the concern that I've raised about the behavior of a lot of the movement right now, especially I think even Wolf's behavior to some degree, as I read read him, you know, he's even talked about, he was on the um, Presby cast talking about situations to, you know, kill heretics, to have the magistrate put them to death. But anyways, um, 
I think one of the things that helps us in this regard is the terrible attitude, not helps us, but that concerns me is the terrible attitude toward governing situations that we've had. I understand there's a terrible attitude towards secularism, but again, as we've distinguished here, common grace is very important in this. And if you've already admitted, Doug, that yes, they can be legitimate. Joe Biden is the president, (laughs) okay, from God, right? Mm Okay. Okay. This is the the way that I hear the discourse. God put him there. The American people didn't. Okay. (laughs) All right. All right. Now we've gotten down to business. (laughs) Okay. All right. So first is the the fruit of the bad fruit of the movement. Just one more point on the bad fruit since I have, because I think other people will be listening to this and I want those crazies to hear this. Okay. Not calling you a crazy, but the bad fruit here, the whole point of second Peter is that the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of oppressive situations. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure that's understood or appreciated at our, our current moment. Speaks of false teachers as people, I was struck by this the other day when I was reading it, as those who despise authority. Mm-hmm. And false teachers, one of their hallmarks is despising authority. They're not afraid of speaking evil of dignitaries. Mm-hmm. Whereas angels, who are greater in power and might, did not bring a reviling accusation against them before the Lord. Jude says the same thing. They reject authority and speak evil of dignitaries, yet Michael the archangel, in contending against the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, did not bring a reviling accusation, but he said, the Lord rebuke you. So Michael wouldn't even bring a reviling accusation against Satan. Against the devil. Okay. Um, Angels won't do this to dignitaries. I just want to read Calvin on this. Okay. Hence, he shows their rash arrogance because they dared to assume more liberty than even angels. Mm-hmm. This is our whole, uh, this is one of my great concerns of Christian nationalism at the moment. It seems strange that he says angels do not bring a railing accusation against magistrates, but we consider the circumstances of the time. What is said applies very suitably to holy angels, for all the magistrates then were ungodly and bloody enemies to the gospel. Um, Wolf might want to check some of his uh, (laughs) recovery and do some reading on this point from Calvin. Um, This is fascinating. He, however, says that men deserving hatred and execration were not condemned by them in order that they might show respect to a power divinely appointed. While 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 such moderation, he says, is shown by angels, these men fearlessly give vent to impious and unbridled blasphemies. Michael dared not speak more severely against Satan, though a reprobate and condemned, than to deliver him to God to be restrained. But these men hesitated not to load with extreme reproaches the powers which God had adorned with peculiar honors. Now these with bold effrontery vomited forth reproaches against magistrates, that they might take away respect for public rights. And this was openly to fight against God by their blasphemies. There are also many turbulent men of this sort at the present day, who proudly declare that the power of the sword is heathen and unlawful and furiously attempt to subvert all government. Such fury Satan excites in order to disturb and prevent the progress of the gospel. Now, my friends, that's my great concern here. Okay. I, I see this all the time in this <laughs> movement. And I, I believe, Doug, I believe since you're a spearhead, you have a responsibility, just like I have a responsibility to speak to these things and calm these people down instead of blowtorch things. So, yeah. so, so the Anna, that's, that's Anabaptism. And my, they were, they took over Munster in the 1530s and throughout the government. That's what we're seeing in Christian nationalism are Anabaptist tendencies to the extreme. Right. Well, a couple of things. First, let me say at the core of this, I agree with you. Uh, one of the formative moments in my boyhood seriously, I still vividly remember it. I grew up in a Southern Baptist church, and at Sunday school, we learned, we were learning the song, I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Yeah. And then I our, remember that one in the Reformed church. All right. The and then, uh, but the, our teacher taught us a, a verse that said, if the devil doesn't like it, he can sit on attack, ow, sit on attack, ow. Yeah. And we came home singing that and got rebuked by my father. <laughs> And this this is when I learned about the verse in, in Jude. Um, you, you don't talk. You don't even talk about the devil that way. Yeah. Um, so I never hear anyone raise this point. Well, I I can I can tell you that I know that there are hotheads 
in the movement that I'm associated with. And I can assure you that I have been doing my level best to deal with the hotheads, to speak to the hotheads. To, um, so I'm, I'm completely, I'm, I'm with you, right? So that, that's the first thing. I'm not pushing back against the point at all. But the wonderful point that Calvin made, which I, with which I agree, he, he could have sent that with maybe some um, uh, spiritual edification to Luther's cartoonists, you know, <laughs> I mean, you know, the, the cartoons of the devil defecating in the Pope's hat, um, they, they was, it's not just Anabaptists. Or, okay. Luther, you get yeah. a few beers into Luther. I understand. <laughs> okay. I, I, I've read enough Luther to know. <laughs> or Calvin. Um, I, mean, I mean, turn Calvin on the Papists and you're going right, to get it again. So there, there's some, there's some um, they, they know how to, I think there's a fundamental commitment that Christians, Christian combatants have to have and a commitment to hit above the belt. And to remember that you you have to fight, you have to do everything you do as a Christian under authority. And those passages you read are part of our marching orders. Uh, we we must love our enemies. We must. If I were if I were put in a position to meet Joe Biden, I'd address him as Mr. President. I would, mm-hmm. you know, I'd want to speak to him, honoring the office that God has bestowed on him. All of those things are true, and I don't want to participate in the cafeteria food fight that characterizes so much online discussion where everything just devolves into name calling and trolling and that sort of thing. That's now, that's, Doug, you know what someone might respond with. Yeah, I know what they might respond with. Okay. And, and <laughs> they say, might go to Denny Burke and read all of the catalog of things that you said. That's right. That and then are, I would, are yes, utterly but, and, shocking. And then, I, no, then I would urge them to go to my response to Denny Burke for a very careful, uh, here's the, here's the important thing. People can assume when they read something spicy that I write that I'm just, I, you know, I can't help myself. It's a personality thing. It's a weapon in the armory that we pick up when we think we need it. It's a tool in the tool chest that we use. Yeah. I know that's your position. Uh, that, but, that's the position. Yeah. Right. But you were going to say something. Yes, let me just, just uh, can I follow just that yeah, real quick? Yeah. But you guys, Oh, how I love thy law, O oh Lord. Mm-hmm. Let no unwholesome word come out of your mouth. That's the law of God. Yeah. Define and that, that, that also means writing. <laughs> also yeah, means correct. correct. Right. It also means Isaiah. It also means Ezekiel. It also means the pattern that the word of God itself gives us. So um, I, I can't have wholesome. Yeah, you're a little bit outside the pattern, Doug. Yeah, no, I'm not. That's the, that's the point. I'm I'm outside of my Victorian great grandmother's. <laughs> I am outside that. That's <laughs> so I there's several things. I again I, think, I, I can okay. only do like perspective here. Yeah. So you know um, there's Doug said a few things on this that I think are worthy of note. One, Doug says just so everybody knows I don't choose like to sin when I write these words and then, you know, ask forgiveness, I believe I'm just and following that law. So he believes he's very much in that law and he's cited and defended it. And you can read the serrated edge and all of that. The other thing that's very interesting, well, just, just a personal testimony since you brought both of us, this um, Doug is a remarkably self-controlled human being. I work right next to the office and I've actually, um, yeah, just like not Luther at all in the slightest. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But then the other thing that was very helpful, and I think this was in your Denny Burke response, you said, I do occasionally, you know, use a hot pepper to get the point across, right? We make a whole dish and there's a hot pepper and I have a reason for doing so. And I think I have biblical justification for doing so. But what so-and-so did when he got all of my quotes and put them all in one article from like years and years of writing is he took, he took all of the peppers, he brought them all together, he put them on a Trisket and served it to your mom sure. so that she wouldn't <laughs> listen to Nancy's blog. <laughs> that's, don't you think, don't and you I, th- that's exactly what happened. Don't like you think though, Jared, being, listen, I'm not trying to be pietistic rambling babbler here uh, that stands, you know, above, above you guys as a, as a more holy person. It's not what I'm doing. Um, But, and I don't want, I don't want to park on this too long, but the above reproach thing, especially because the fruit of it is creating these kind of warriors that I'm seeing everywhere. um, I think somebody who has the kind of influence that you have has a responsibility to set by example in in speaking the truth in love, set by example a way that models how Christians 
ought to behave in the public square. I it's agree acceptable. entirely. And I just want to underscore, that's, I, I think Doug is a perfect model for that kind of thing. So you're right to say, hey, you've got this voice. And I want to say, yeah, and that's why, that's why um, young men that want to navigate this particular time are actually attracted to the ministry that's going on. Some of them are. Some of them are, and the people the people online that you are worried about, I would be willing to bet you a hundred dollars. I'd be worried about also. Well, some are CREC men, uh, yeah. ministers yeah. acting. Yes. So, so, so but okay. the, the point is, if the the people that you would be worried about in their online rhetoric and off the chain stuff, mm -hmm. and I'd be worried about for the same reason, and quite possibly have spoken to them about. Um, Let's just without, without betraying anything. I've sought to address those sorts of things. The people that you are thinking are following my lead are the people in my life who are the least likely to follow my lead. Okay, R right? Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, coming back to something we talked about earlier, I I want to agree with you that there is there are cycles. I think one thing that is lost that I actually agree with you on here is the cycle of iniquity the bestial nature of kingdoms as they ebb and flow. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's, that's really important for people to remember. Um, Revelation at times presents a state in its worst form, and Christians have to in, in remember the calling to be faithful in the midst of that. We're going to come back to theonomy and postmillennialism in a second. I keep saying this, but we've got, I want to get somewhere. So, um, but I just, I, I want you to know, doing good. I agree with the... The iniquity of the Amorites must be complete. Yeah. Um, that's an important principle in this, uh, yeah. that what we are experiencing, and nations run in cycles, cycles of iniquity. Churches run in cycles. Um, denominations, institutions. Right. The nation's running in a cycle. And we have to leave that to the judgments of the Lord right. without prying into those. I understand decretive. I, I get all that. But... How we conduct ourselves, what our goals and aspirations shall be. Well, Jared, I look forward in a minute to raising one of your points. So, um, <laughs> yeah, this is, this, is, this is good. All right, persecution and suffering. By the way, intrusion ethics is important. I don't know if you've spent any time on that, but God intervenes just like Sodom, intervening birth pains with judgments. Mm -hmm. It's not like things are just willy nilly going out of control outside spinning out of control hell you know the sky's falling the sky's falling the toby comet um the, the intrusion ethics are important in this that god intervenes in history and god does judge i i'm i fully agree with that in your in your book in mere christendom you posed a question to kingdom to kingdoms advocates on that front of course the standard is god judges and he also judges magistrates mm -hmm. who are ungodly psalm 82 according to the principle of justice <laughs> whether they maintain justice even in the next statement he says even though you're blind and know nothing right. but he still expected them amen. to help the poor yes. and the needy all right amen suffering and Christology and persecution. Okay, I'm going to read a statement. I'm getting warmed up. So I'm <laughs> going to read a statement here. We'll um, know when you start waving your <laughs> yeah. arms. When you start waving your arms. We're gonna... <laughs> now I'm getting fired up. It's happening. So, um, Wolf, this statement, I, I wanted to take the book and, you know, okay. It's to our shame that we sheepishly tolerate the assaults against our Christian heritage. We are dead inside, talking about Christians, lacking the spirit to drive against the open mockery of God and claim what is ours in Christ. Well, I wanted to say up front that then even Jesus didn't pass your test. Um, here's a statement that gets to the heart of my concern on that. He's the one that cleansed the temple. Okay. I, and, and by the way, that was a sort of redemptive historical act. I'm not, Calvin even cautions, I'm not sure that applies to everyone. No, but it applies, um, to, it applies to Jesus. Amen. The amen. Ze the zeal for God's house yeah, consumed but, him, so he wasn't dead But inside. what was the example specifically, Doug? That, well, let me, let me answer. What was the example specifically, First Peter, Jesus left us? Yeah. I, the example is when he was insulted, he did not insult. When he correct. was beaten, it did not be. He entrusted himself to him who judges righteously, and then he suffered and died on the cross. I'm just, so uh, was Jesus sheepishly tolerating the assaults against him? Uh, sheepishly? No, yeah. as a warrior king. Yeah, I'm, I'm just pointing out that cleansing yeah. of the temple meant that he did pass Wolf's test. 
not, I wasn't talking about what example he set for us that we're commanded to follow. We are, we are commanded in Peter to follow the example and follow in his steps to follow the, you know, to accept the slings and arrows that get thrown at us. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's by a cross, my friend, a cross that the victory was won. Um, I think Wolf's whole project has distracted Christians. Another one of my big concerns. And he says, well, I'm not engaging scripture. I'm doing political theory. Yeah, right. You've used scripture where you want. You left out the index, by the way. You use scripture where you want, and that's a good example. But anyways, let me read this. Turretin on uh, post, well, I call it postmillennialism. It's Kiliasm, but it's the precursor mm-hmm. to postmillennialism. Here's why that statement wait, bothers wait, me. Wait, no. Kiliasm is a precursor to premillennialism. I disagree. Okay. <laughs> I just full on disagree. All right. All right. If there should be a time of a thousand years in which the whole church and not merely a certain part of it should enjoy peace and felicity, how could the cross be called her characteristic? Or how would she be a church conformed to Christ her head who is sanctified by affliction? Who ever told us it's supposed to go well for us here? So, you know, you engage a little bit in mere Christendom. You know, the Christians and Hebrews rejoiced in the plundering of their property. I'm not sure you could say that to a Christian nationalist today. You say it to me. Well, good. <laughs> I even have a hard time with that. So I, I would have a really hard time with that. But there, that's turning the other cheek to an extreme level. Right. Um, but I, I guess what I'm saying then is it seems like Jesus is only Lord if it's going well for us. What about appointed persecution, suffering and affliction? And I know you're not going to disagree with this, with this point, but what I have a real concern with here is that Abraham, from the very call at the beginning, was dragged away from his homeland. Mm-hmm. He's told you're not to have loyalties ultimately to that homeland. You're supposed to leave that homeland and come to me. What I'm worried about is our place in this world, what I'm worried about is we have we are really pursuing a, a a theology of glory, not a theology of the cross. What I'm worried about here is that we have forgotten that we're pilgrims, strangers, and aliens. What I'm worried about here is that we have become so earthly minded right. that we are no heavenly good. <laughs> okay. right. Remember, so. remember something. There's there's an important thing to note here, and I'm I'm not this is I'm not playing a violin or anything like this here. You introduced me. Tucker said I was the most controversial pastor in America. I'm also one of the most reviled pastors in America. Okay. So I know what it's like to be lied about. I know what it's like to be insulted. I know what it's like to be attacked. I know what it's like to have property. You know, I've uh, well, I, have, I have a feeling I'm going to learn about it after this interview, but go ahead. <laughs> right. Hey, hey. So uh, the, uh, the, there are stories I could tell you. And the, the, so, but the point is, I am not preaching a lazy boy Christianity disguise, you know, with the rhetoric of a theology of glory. Yeah, but there's there's a the, the rugged masculinity thing, you know, kind of puff out the chest and uh you know, I, I don't understand no quarter November. But I think the thing well, you're not that supposed to understand it, you're supposed to laugh at it. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a joke. Faith okay. seeking understanding. Duh, faith duh, seeking duh, duh, understanding. Duh, duh, duh. Okay. All right. But you're out there blowtorching things. Yeah. Um You can't you can't imagine how much fun that was. Oh, okay. Man, I'm sure it was fun, <laughs> no, but that's fun. the kind of thing, you know, you know, you, you just keep to yourself. Like because of our of our situation. <laughs> this is, I, I got, well, several things. I got, uh, one of one of my favorite lines, I've dropped this before, that Doug has said was, <clears throat> he says, we're surrounded at the Alamo and I, you can have three ways of being faithful. You know, the first, first way is you walk out and you say, uh, we've considered all of our options, sir, and uh, we've decided we must fight. You know, so you walk back and you fight. Second option is you walk out with a stern voice. You say, you are about to fight you. You're going down. You know, we've decided. To, he's like, that's faithful too. But I recommend a third option, which is you'd walk out and look at your enemy and say, mm, I don't think so, Skippy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so the, 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 the blowtorch is uh, joy and not being worried or bent out of shape. Uh, so that that's that's a yeah, side note. That's that's your interpretation. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's not everyone else's. I'll tell you that. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, I want to say to some of these guys, I'm not not coming after you here, but you know, if you're going to do the rugged masculinity thing, some of you guys need to get to the gym. <laughs> I mean, it's like you know. So I have a hard time with that whole thing, um, just because you're, you're agreeing with Stephen Wolf there. By the way, 
He, he this, thinks people should, yeah. He, he, he's a gym. big. If he's I a, accept his premise, if well, I accept no, his you're, premise. Yeah, he's a big go to the gym guy too. The post, I want to talk about this. Uh, this the way that you talked about post mill, like he's lazy boy, lazy river. The it's um the advancement of the kingdom is like a D Day advancement kind of thing. And this would even go to the quote that you read is like, well, there's of course there's going to be taking up the cross, but it's taking up the cross to sac. Men, the blessing comes on the other side of the cross. So the same way it worked for our Lord. It was for the joy that was set before him that he endured the cross. Well, you lay down your wife, your life for your wife. What happens? Well, you you sanctify her. She's sanctified. She's washed. She's blessed. And things things on the back end, the fruit comes because you were toiling, because you were going about your work. It's the same principle with the kingdom. So it's not. I would. I would very much agree and warn people against any concept of like a post mill concept where you're going to get to a point and you're going to chill, you know, you're going to chill. And that's like what it's about. No, it's always about the advancement of God's kingdom as we pray, as we labor, as we The worry about theology of glory is if someone thinks they're going to stroll into the millennium with their hands in their pockets, go straight, going straight to the glory and no cross. um, That's just ludicrous. It's just ludicrous. But the opposite is also the case. There are people who are living a perpetual crucifix. Christ is always on the cross, and it's not the narrative. It's the death and resurrection. So um, there's the old blues song that says, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. Um, there, the pattern that we are given in Scripture over and over again <laughs> is you lay down, you take up your cross daily, you follow Christ, you're willing to die. I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. All of those things are true, but th- this, it's a story. God vindicates his people. And so when God raises uh, Jesus from the dead and he calls us to follow him, we're called to follow that whole pattern. We're called to follow him through the story, which means there are going to be dark valleys and there's going to be triumphant victories. And in Right. I mean, he, I agree that Hebrews 11 catalogs that. Right. It goes back and forth, but that's, that's to the providence of the Lord. Yeah, absolutely. Right. right. Okay. Um, in terms of... Um, Sermon on the Mount, ethics, I guess what I, I'm i concerned about is what becomes of distinctively Christian character when we, we come into positions of power. Um, law is inherently coercive. This is what you do. And there's, it, it's, it seems to me it becomes Minecraft and Soulcraft at this point, that that's what we've seen in history with this. And do you ever think that the Lord specifically doesn't want something to be labeled specifically Christian? Number one, because then you're making it holy, sanctified, set apart. The only institution we have for that in the New Covenant that's specifically designated that way is the church when Jesus spoke to Peter. He, he made these governments common at the beginning. That's, that's what we talked about from Genesis 9. They're common, they're legitimate, they're provisional, they're going to expire— um, but don't you think he wants to keep us out of, pers- uh, once out of positions of power precisely because the, the, this, the otherworldly ethic that we are supposed to carry with us would be threatened and lost. I'm just kidding. I'm just making sure I understand. Are you, um, this is, is this question from like a group or a position that thinks Christians shouldn't become civil authorities? No, I'm not. I'm not Anabaptist. Like he, like, but you like doesn't he want to keep us from positions of power? I'd say no. no I would he, say I get okay. Let me let me be clear on that. Okay. What I'm saying is is that having specifically Christianized government, right? Okay, that's what I'm talking about. Okay, I'm not saying Christians can't get into positions of power. I, I, uh, you know, as a Christian, just like I'd run my business, I think there's a parallel. I would be, I would hopefully be a good Christian in that in that in that arena in that sphere. I hope I would do things justly and honorably, but to impose it and sanctify the institution and call it holy at that point, deeming it that way because we've Christianized it. Maybe it's just the adjective Christian Christian on everything that's really causing the issue here. It's the Luther's comment where you, a cobbler is not a Christian cobbler by putting little crosses on the shoes. Um, he He's a Christian cobbler by making good shoes. Right. There are times when God wants the magistrate to... Uh, simply do the job and not drag Jesus into it. Like you've got to have John three sixteen attached to everything. 
Just, just do your yeah, job. Yeah, I don't want the magistrate messing with religion must have all, much right. at all. Yeah, I, we're, I, at we're, all. We're pretty lame about that. And I also don't want, like, the guy that has a sprinkler company just, like, slapping a sticker on his bumper and that being, like, a Christian right. business. But at the same time, at the same time, Daniel made a point of praying with his windows open. Yeah, I mean, okay, he didn't stop. He didn't. He didn't shut out his Christianity when he left the church, well, well, no, right? He, and he opened his door. He showed it. He could have. He, he could have yeah. defied. He uh, could. Well, he, well, he, he did defy. He, no, he he, he could have prayed secretly, as Jesus says to do. No, right? I preach that, and I I agree with you. Right. Like it's really remarkable. Daniel wanted that scene. There are times. That's my point. There are times when it's important to attach the name of Christ to it, and there are times when it's simply not, not necessary. Mm, mm, mm. Okay, I know Kuiper, anti-revolutionary party, w- believed you could have a Christian, you could have a Christian government. Right. That was assumed. It was received from Protestants. It was handed to them from the Middle Ages, the whole yeah. Christendom. You know, I don't think going back to that arrangement is helpful or even possible. The whole thing's a pipe dream, by the way, in our current situation. You in know that. Current, That's why you're saying 500 game. years down. The, I get game. it. I get Three it. yards in a cloud yeah. of dust. Yeah, yeah. I, get, I get that. Yeah. Um, but But I guess... Oh, well, I'll still come back to that. <laughs> but um, but we agree. The, Long the, game. The, ser- the Sermon on the Mount, I'm just, I'm, I'm concerned. We we've already beat this point. Sermon on the Mount, the Christian ethic, the meek, the humble, um, these are not the characteristics I'm seeing of Christians at the moment. And I think we need to be really careful. So I'll just say that. Power, Amen. power, Amen. power. Amen. Satan's third assault. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give to you if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Satan was really offering Jesus Christian nationalism. So, And Jesus said, I'm not going to receive that as a gift from you. I'm going to take it from you. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll I'm talk about buy, resurrection. I'm we'll gonna, talk I'm about resurrection. Find the strong man and strip him of his panoply. So, okay. And all authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I look forward to talking about that. So we don't get from Jesus, though, Judaism, nationalism. We don't get John 6. They wanted to force him to make him king. I realize what you would say. That's pre-cross. I understand understand that argument. Um, But even afterwards, even afterwards, as we see in Acts, Great Commission, we see them going out. We don't see them doing what you guys are proposing. Oh, we Absolutely. Um, so what we're proposing is a Christian house that needs to be built. In the Acts of the Apostles, all you see are people out in the field digging trenches and pouring footings. And the footings don't look anything like the finished house. So does Constantine finish that house? No. Constantine messed up the first floor. Okay. <laughs> after, after killing his relatives, right? Well, um, so, so, but here, here's the thing. Uh, Constantine made Christianity legal. Um, Theodosius m- made it sort of the religion of the empire. The- so Theodosius is the good guy, right, in in this narrative. But Theodosius, there was a riot in Thessalonica, and Theodosius lost his temper and had like 7,000 Thessalonians killed. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he's the Christian emperor. So the first Christian emperor of a Christian nationalism is guilty of a mass murder in Thessalonica. Yeah, I know. I know you. You don't want one point You want two point I, I want. I, I actually want three point But two point okay. is next. But Ambrose of Milan excommunicated him, right? And he had no regiments. He had no. Uh, he he. All he had was spiritual authority. I'm with Ambrose, not with Theodosius, and I I, I know that there are, there will be all kinds of atrocious things done in the name of Jesus in any kind of Christian national nationalism project. I know that. But this is a fallen world. But don't you think that's precisely why, Doug, he doesn't want the adjective Christian slapped on a governing system? There's going to be an adjective of some sort attached to it. Why? Uh, I, I, I feel I, what, I, what I believe Genesis 6 is saying is it shouldn't be. No, I'm saying that, that we, have, we have rulers, and they're either, when the wicked rule, the people mourn. When the righteous rule, the people rejoice. That's all I'm saying. It's yeah. better to have the righteous rule than to have yeah, the wicked rule. Right. Just, just, okay, if you want to do that, if we, you know, great. I, I, I would love to have a moral, godly man as president. 
Yeah. I, I mean, good I, luck, by the way. Yeah. Well, but no, that's, but that but, is but, the but, thing but that you we're. Get my, you get my. Yeah. Uh, so I would love to have that. Right. I just don't. I don't want the coercive power of the theonomic project. As, and, and this is what you guys have to understand and appreciate the whole thing, that whole mutt and you're tied, you, you, you know, rush to any influence, apologia, you know, the, the whole thing is, is, is so built out of that entire system. You know, Doug, you say, you do say one thing and then over here, you seem to say another and it creates this muddled way of dealing with the whole movement that is pushing a theonomic system upon us that will be inherently coercive. And, and, and again, I think the, the fair question has been raised, you know, what branch of Christendom gets the power? I, I mean, what are you going to do with the Irish Catholics <laughs> immigrating? What are you going to do to but, the, the mosque you, but, down the street? You see, but you've already referred to the chapter in Mere Christendom, where I argue the central theonomic imperative is to limit the government. And That's the central thing. My my project is not to get the apparatus to seize control of the currently swollen government and then use that apparatus to make a bunch of people do a bunch of Christian things. That is absolutely antithetical to the project I I would have want to have anything to do with it, do with. If if I had my theonomic way, the federal government would be one tenth its current size and would be not uh, we'd be restraining the biggest blasphemer first, not going around bossing people around. I'm yeah. I'm a theocratic I'm a theocratic libertarian. I do think though that it is inherently coercive, but that's that's like as you've you've said this earlier. This that's all law. That's all civil authority. That's what they're doing. Is they're, it the job of government to? Impose the, morality? Yes. Make yeah. you may okay. not kill. What, what, historic, not generally. You may stop, not kill babies. Stop killing the babies. Fair that's, enough. Okay. That's yeah, the, but the, absolutely. But, because I, that, but that's a, that can be a natural law argument. Sure. Well, well, but it's the, imposing morality. But the natural, yeah. but this, yeah, I do think well, this is the well, principle. what I'm saying is, absolutely. But there's, the, the natural law arguments that are based on the basic moral law of God, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you're going to enforce, how you're going to enforce second commandment. I don't know how you're going to enforce, and you you even in mere Christendom make real cl clear that we need to be careful of enforcing third commandment. Before so, we go, you know, to Kuiper, be Kuiper believed fourth, right. right? He believed fourth, but just as preserving the day, right? As I understand it, yeah. Okay. I want I want to highlight something before you get into like the you got first table, second table, you get all those kind of issues. But the, back to the adjectival thing, right? It's like you were you brought up the question about it being Christian, and we said well, it's going to have some kind of adjective, and you said I don't think it should have an adjective, and <clears throat> I think there are people that are are basically thinking that way. Like it, we need to detach Christianity from the from the crown or from the civil authority, but the sweet psalmist of Israel, Second Samuel twenty three, right? When when a man rules over others in the fear of God, he dawns on them like the morning light. Like the sun shining forth on a cloudless see, morning, but I think we want—I want people to aim for that. Like that, I think every Christian should say what we're praying for is what David talked about. Like we want, we want leaders that fear the Lord, and that's not—that might be different than the conversation about the what title you give it, but it's certainly not Islam. Like certainly not Buddhism. It's the fear. It's the fear of Yahweh. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess. Um, you know, in terms of theocracy, in terms of the place of that in history, um, I don't. I, I believe the situation that we are in is very similar to Daniel and Babylon. I believe the situation we are in is very similar to Israel in in Egypt, um, the Joseph narrative. Yeah. So, so you know, Daniel did not try to impose and transform and. The theocratize, if you can set the right word. No, never. <laughs> Babylon, that was not, he had to, he had to live there. Daniel didn't, but Nebuchadnezzar did. Yeah, sure. Well, fair fair enough. The but people, but, but the Nebuchadnezzar that God raised up to do that. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, Nebuchadnezzar faced the judge, judgment of the Lord, but he was a tool of the Lord, instrument of the Lord to judge his people. Right. So, so Daniel's in the kind of situation, since we are called the elect from Babylon, Daniel's in the very sort of situation that helps us, not perfectly, but helps us to understand that we are outside the land, Jared. I, I guess I, I, there's, again, one of my concerns with the whole theonomic project is they, they just make no distinction. 
in the theocratic arrangement of Israel in the land and what some of those, even how, how we handle imprecatory psalms we could talk about, you know, in the land, theocratic arrangement as to the situation we are in. We conduct ourselves wisely. We conduct ourselves faithfully. If an arrogant king asserts himself over over the Lord, it's interesting how Jan, Daniel will even change person in speaking. Um, it's, 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 but Daniel conducts himself in such a wise way as a pilgrim and alien longing for home. I fear we've got a whole bunch of people not longing for anything, but America as their ultimate homeland. Mm -hmm. That's a danger. Yeah. Yeah. It's a big danger. But we, it's a danger, but that is a danger that's confronting the people, the people who want to take America back and the people who want to let sleeping dogs lie. Both of them live in America. And both of them can be trying to preserve, feather their own nests. Uh, we are, we are to have our eyes on the main goal, which is the resurrection of the dead and everything being restored. Uh, we are, we are doing what we do so that we can be faithful in our station and in our generation. Not because we think that our generation can be made into a makeshift heaven. Okay, it can't. The, the catastrophic postmillennialism. Let's let's go to postmillennialism for a minute. Let me just let's talk about how fun, much fun it is. Okay, <laughs> I'm I'm a very I'm having a fun time as an all So the optimistic um, all op, I'm very optimistic. Um, so I I take it. I'm sure you've interacted with Second Helvetic. Okay. We further condemn Jewish dreams that there will be a, a golden age on earth before the day of judgment, and that the pious, having subdued all their godless enemies, will possess all the kingdoms of the earth. For evangelical truth, quotes a bunch of passages there. Right. That sounds like your view, that well, they're condemning. If, if I were to subscribe to the second Helvetic, I think I would have to take an exception to that. Okay. Fair enough. To that Fair enough. part. Fair enough. Okay. Um, all the nations coming before Christ returns to repentance, partial, all? Well, all. Okay. I, I don't think it's each and every individual is converted. Right, but every single nation. I think every tribe, every nation, every, every tongue will confess. So you take this in nationalistic concepts. Well, so in, it might, not necessarily nation state, but all the social groupings of people. There may be tribes in the Amazon that are not part of it that aren't a nation the way we understand a nation, but they're a cohesive social unit. They will come. All the, all the people, all, every tongue, every, and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He right. must reign till he puts all his enemies, enemies under, under his, his feet. feet. Okay, I, I heard you, I think it was Durbin, in the Bonson Conference say, that's the verse that convinced me of postmillennialism. I hate to tell you, you got it wrong. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> you, oh, no. You had to come to Escondido to hear that. Um, that, double, that double, double humiliation. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, Doug, that verse, he must reign to all his enemies, is in, is the, is in the context there. Of, it's a Psalm 1, you know, Psalm 110, Psalm 2, and you know to read the verses around that, which says he rules in the midst of his enemies, the whole, the whole structure of that, which is a chiasm, mm -hmm. puts that in the center mm -hmm. as the coming day of the Lord, as okay. the arrival of the Lord, when on that great day of his return, we will see that manifested, manifestedly evident, but not before. Um, I, by the way, you know that that uh, verse is inscribed on the high altar of Westminster Abbey, right? I did not know that. Yeah. State-sponsored religion, by the way. Um, <laughs> and, we, and we see how well that's going. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, which is kind of a fair point, right? Right. Um, all right. So this is how you've pitched things. Everything is presented, I think, is that this is how I'm reading you, that we are at this really bad moment. We are in this, this the, the worst of evils, Everyone's stirred up. We've come into something. There's no doubt. Mm -hmm. um, I quoted the Toby verse where I was going to save it for here. You know, secularism has metastasized our organs and lymph nodes. No, we're not pugnacious enough. We're not fierce enough. Um, 
when we talk about postmillennialism, you know, I, I think of Christ, I'm sending you out as lambs among wolves, announced to every house, peace to this house. Mm-hmm. Um, that's not theocratic. And they did it, that. They did that. And three centuries later, Rome fell. Yes. Okay. Fair. Good. But, but the whole no fire on enemies kind of thing is important. What I'm concerned about here is the most dramatic language possible is being used. I'm coming back to this as if we're in the most, uh, it, it's created this utter panic mode and people are completely distressed. The scare tactics, um, the scare tactics are not helping people. Um, so Again, I would ask, I would ask, can we, can we say that Jesus has bound up the strong man and will plunder his house? Can we talk about plundering? Do, yeah, I have that here. But um, is that, that language, that's, is that the kind, would that language fit in the bucket you're talking about that you're worried about? If somebody's like, let's go plunder the enemy's and, and house. And, and in Luke, it's panoply. It's strip the devil of his armor. It's yeah. a fight. Yeah, he still roams around like a roaring lion. Yeah, but, right? we, but it's a militaristic. Image. Yeah, he's he's bound him in the sense of what Revelation twenty says. No. Yeah, Am well, I missing I, something? I, I, no, I think we agree that, about what it's uh, it's a spiritual metaphorical statement. My point is that the rhetoric <laughs> is militaristic. Well, sure. That's that. This is the beauty of Christ's priestly work fulfilling the. The cultural mandate for us. You know? Right. So um, this is exactly, you know, uh, Romans 5, we are reigning with him right now. Oh. Um, the, the reign has begun. Psalm 2 and 1, Psalm 110, when Jesus ascended into heaven, when he said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth, his reign has begun. The great reign we're looking right. for has begun. We're in it. And, and you, you've made the statement somewhere. You said, Doug, um, you know, maybe we're we're in the early church. Oh, I think we are. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's yeah, you have such, to take that position. Yeah, I think it's, that's you, why it's such a mess. <laughs> you have to take that position. But I guess you know one of my one of my great concerns is: <laughs> Do you notice what's being absolutely missed in this discussion? Nobody's talking about the second coming. I don't ever hear it. It's like people. Nobody, do you believe he could return right now? You know, all the, it seemed to be all the apostles, I, I, and I'm not, I'm not a preterist, all the apostles, Second Thessalonians 2, book of Revelation, they all told the people of the Lord, be ready. It can happen at any hour. You guys have put this great condition on the arrival of the kingdom in your vision, post-millennial uh, vision, that I think actually undermines the imminent doctrine of the return of Christ. Well, yeah, but not talking about the imminent return of Christ is not the same thing as not talking about the return of Christ. Yeah, but it's just anticlimactic to, in many ways, to this great project of Christianizing nations. I don't know if it is. I, I, I That's actually, how it comes off. I actually think you have a. I think you have a good point that I would. I would pitch to all of the post millennialists first that are out there, you know, listening, and then see if it, we can weave it into an optimistic amo wherever people are. But there is some the the return of Christ, the bodily return of Christ, of course, is glorious doctrinal Bible through and through. But it's actually like we proclaim the Lord's death until He comes, right? Uh, we live by faith. And you love the one who you have not seen, and then you you will see him one day, right? There's potency in um, commending the gospel of Jesus Christ, and I would say, as a post mill or optimistic ah mill, that we should actually be anchoring it there more and more. I think you make a good point. Now, again, I'm not saying imminent, but um, absolute, like return of Christ, and then you're set in this realm of the conquest of the kingdom until that glorious day. Right. right. I, I, I preach through Thessalonians. I, I, and so um, I believe that you can't preach through the New Testament without Maranatha or Jesus come. And the fact that I believe that some of the passages that some Christians apply to the end of the world, I think were fulfilled in the first century. Doesn't I'm a partial preterist, not a full preterist, which means I believe there's a glorious return of the Lord Jesus coming again in power and glory. I'm preaching. I just started a series through Acts, and I'm going to be uh, preaching the Ascension and the 
two men in white saying he's going to come back that as it happens this next Sunday, I'm going to be preaching the second coming of Christ where he comes again in just the same way that he left. Um, so that's, uh, that's just another area where I'd yeah, say, I guess, amen. I guess when we come to this pessimism or optimism thing, you know, I'm inherently optimistic as a post mill because I believe as the, an optimistic optimo. Opti- op, what did I say? I think he, I, I think, but I think he just did. I just. He, oh, I think he just a, joined. As a post, he just joined. He just joined. <laughs> I that I did not. Like that. That I did not. Um, About the grace well, abounding. Well, that's one thing I'm glad you corrected me on because <laughs> you you might not have, and then you'd have posted that on there. Right. <laughs> but um, so, so I'm I'm optimistic because I don't think I'm missing anything right now. I think the nations are streaming in. Well, you're missing the kingdom think, of heaven think, is at hand. I, I think, yeah, I think it's happening. I think you're missing so, good governance of California. Yeah, no, I'm not missing good governance of the church. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I. But my point is, is um, I think I think postmillennialism is not honest because, well, let me just quote James White here. He's kind of fun. Um. What is the greatest enemy I could ever conceive of that needs to be crushed under the feet of Christ? <laughs> Great question, James. Maybe you'll invite me on the dividing line so we can debate this. Um, we can try to arrange it. <laughs> <laughs> are you kidding? You ready for the answer? All right. The secular state. Now, what about sin and death? Same thing. No, it's not the same thing. That is not the same thing. The nations, I want to remind you, Doug, are a drop in the bucket. Yeah. Um, what has happened to James White to come to that kind of conclusion? Like, that, that is really concerning to me. That took my breath away. Um, to say that, and he said it with you, because um, I, I watched that, that, uh, that thing, that is alarming to me because that exactly proves the problem. He is a great pessimist right now. Um. Postmillennialism has become very pessimistic until the 500-year plan unfolds. And I would say that the Amil is inherently optimistic because he's saying there's nothing that is lacking in the glory of Christ's kingdom, even through suffering in the present. He is winning the victory. Jesus said so clearly when he said, um, my kingdom is not of this world, we would fight. But then he said, be of good cheer. When? Right now. Do you believe the kingdom of God grows? Sure, like a mustard seed. Okay. So, but but, you, yeah, but, but I but, like this. I'm but, like, oh, but, with but you. But through much tribulation, we enter. Because we enter through tribulation does not make me pessimistic. I'm oh. so sick of that. Well, yeah. I, yeah, right? ne- ne- does second, it. second the motion. Uh, uh, but particularly, I, uh, I'm just adding, I'm putting a little... But do you see uh, my point, Jared? Oh, yeah, the, people the, are... The, su- the, there's just... there. The, the, you know, they've changed their dress. They're they're warriors. You know, they're 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 tough guys. They're out there, they're out there with the tats. You know, they're ready to show how tough they are because they got to take back the culture for Christ. They got to bring in this post millennial vision, and they've riled everyone up. And I'm saying, calm down, you guys. You no, know what? No. Just take a chill pill. Now we're know? no wait wait. This is really important. Everybody's already riled up. All uh, I'm not. <laughs> no, no, I'm, talking, I'm, I'm a very out, optimistic uh, Amil, Doug. Out there, yeah, yeah, uh, peace out there, like a river. In a out soul. there, out there in the countryside, the thing that riled everybody up was the behavior of the secular state. It wasn't because I've I've got people. Yeah, but looking, I expect that. Yeah, yeah, so do I. But the point, the the people who got riled up weren't expecting it because they believed the myth of neutrality. They believed it was possible for us to go cruise down the road at on autopilot and everything's decent and orderly because this is America. When the uh, Van Til uses the phrase epistemological self consciousness, when the when the bad guys started to become sort of self aware of their lust for power, and they started to reach for everything, demanding to control everything. They started. They started doing things like the sex change and uh, homosexual marriage and all of the things, and a lot of ordinary folks who were not really steeped in theology got freaked out. I'm not freaking them out. Oh, I, I don't know. <laughs> uh, no, I'm. I'm having. I'm having people who get freaked out out there and who are attracted to what we're saying because what we're saying is a 
believe it or not, is a calming influence. God is in control. Doug, I, I appreciate you saying that, but on the ground, I just, I just different, totally disagree. That is not what this has created. Um, I, I think it's, I think it's created, um, people who've lost their minds in this stuff. Right. Um, and it, it's, we're seeing that mostly in the theonomic reconstructive post mill movement. We're not seeing it from the common people who believe classically <laughs> in amillennialism as Voss defined it. This goes back, this goes back to the point that I'm making. The people who really are losing their minds are not the people that we are putting in charge of anything. They're the people that are not paying attention to what we're saying. They're losing their minds, but I'm afraid we're going to lose our minds in response. And that that's that's where I'm coming back to Sermon on the Mount. I, I want to say, you know, I said it before, but calm down. It's okay. Jesus is on the throne. Jesus is Lord. You, you, you know, he is Lord, not, you know, he is Lord even when it's not going well for you. He is Lord mm -hmm. even when you have abusive taxation. He is Lord even when you're being pummeled. He is Lord, you know, th that's the kind of thing I think you need to calm the sheep with. Jesus loves his sheep. Christ has died for his sheep. Not one will be plucked from his hand. Not one will be lost. The governing authorities can't harm them. Not one hair from their he head can fall without the will of the Father in heaven. These are the kind of messages we need. What, what I feel like we don't need right now is people saying, go and exert and take back the square because it's yours, which is what uh, I'm This hearing. is interesting that you bring this up. As you're talking, I'm thinking like, Knox, give me Scotland or I die. Yeah. God. Now, that is, and what's interesting is multiple times you've gone back to the decree, and I... Yeah, I don't have, I, access. I, I don't have access. I think that's good. I think it's your right to pull on the sovereignty of God. Right? He knows not a single hair on your head. Those those truths are, uh, are glorious um, and certainly should be employed pastorally to help someone who's losing it, right? Who's, who's really setting his hair on fire. And, and there are such people. And we've, we've said this before, but I, I do think there are people that, especially the Reformed, that understand the decree and they understand God's providence. But I don't know that they've thought about the promises and what God has... Well, that's good. I like that point. Right? You need to think about the promises. Okay. It, particularly yeah. like, yes, what is God's... What is God's will? Like, do you have a right to say to God, God, give me Scotland or I die? Are you warranted to even speak in that way? No. Now, so, so, okay, <laughs> no. so now we're getting no. to the nub, right? No. We're getting to the nub. There's, Let's there's, get there's, to the nub. We're getting to the nub. <laughs> there, there are, but what I want to point out is the people you're worried about that are setting their hair on fire, they're not setting their hair on fire because they believe God has promised them they Scotland. want America or they're going to die. Yeah, yeah, but but the, but they're not actually trusting the Lord for America. The people that are setting their hair on fire aren't doing it. What we're doing is really going, yes, guys, Jared, God has promised us here America. Here we have no continuing city. We have to, like, say that to ourselves. Okay, here's, 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 let, me, in, in, let me just make sure everyone hears that. Here we have no continuing city. We are not uh -huh. saving the city. The city will be burned, just uh, as it was in the days of Noah. Uh, yeah, so it's not continuing, but it will be. It will be redeemed. No, no, and no, then, so it that, be, then it will be. Then it will die and rise again. Here we go. Here's okay, let me try. I, I, okay, I've got to jump in here. I I happen to bring a copy of the Westminster Confession of Faith here, and I've got it in the original Greek. Okay, <laughs> so um, I'm I'm uh, I subscribe to the Westminster, as does our church. And we subscribe to the original British version of the Westminster. Although I'm probably on the, in the chapter on the civil magistrate, I'm closer to the American revision of the Westminster than to the. Uh, I think the British Westminster is functionally Erastian, where the magistrate can appear at councils and settle whether what's decided yes, them I, I, is in accordance okay, with the. Fair enough. I, I don't think the civil. You don't want Ronald Reagan, who believed in the fundamental goodness of man, presiding over Dort. You no, I, I Stephen can't. Stephen Wolf might need to hear that. Right, right. So I don't. <laughs> I don't want Ronald Reagan or Donald Trump or I. I don't. Which want, I like Reagan, by the way. I'll I, take him back. <laughs> I, I, I take him back too. But the so, but the point is, <laughs> as someone who subscribes to Westminster and its chapter on the civil magistrate, it obligates me to want to ask for America. Okay. Okay. I, um, 
as a nursing father, right? right that's what it says. Um, I want the civil government to provide the protection, justice, those things that are good so that the church continue to do her work. Um, but I pray for, and this is, this is where I think the Matthew 28 thing comes here. I think, I think when you, when you say nations, I didn't want to get here yet. I know our time's getting short. When you say nations, I'm not understanding it the same way you are. Right. That's part of the issue. I just say what, all the people, however they're grouped. People Before, groups. People groups okay. out of every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. Because those nations are going to be judged on the no, last day. It doesn't day. say out of. It says disciple, the so, nations. So, so, but it does in Revelation. And, yeah. and it yeah. does say in Revelation, they, they're called from out of every right. tribe, tongue, people. And it says, Doug, that those nations will be judged. How... If all the nations were saved before Christ came or, or bowed to the knee and were saved, why are they going to be judged? Because, Revelation. Because Paul says in Corinthians that we'll all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. No, no, no. Not, not, in, not in the sense that Revelation's talking. Revelation's talking about the finality of wrath, the bowls of wrath, the, 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 the crushing. Right. Before, but maybe a question, I just have a question for you as you brought this up. You believe that the, with Westminster, you believe that the civil magistrate has the duty of protecting the church? I believe it has the, the responsibility to, pro, to promote justice and to protect it from lawless aggression so that the church in her sphere, right? I'm, I'm a sphere sovereignty guy. In her sphere should be left to do her work. Un, it, unimpeded, unhindered. Right. Un and do you believe the civil master has, an, has the responsibility before God to protect the church in a way it doesn't have that responsibility to protect a mosque or a Buddhist temple? I, the, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I like our system... Here in the United States, I, I this is but where that's I, not here. That's not the system that they were representing in the Westminster. Right, Congress. but the 1788. I mean, De Young just made yeah. a point on this, right? In his article, he just made a big point that they're two radically different opposed views. Well, no, but I'm just going with the American version. Yeah, it says American, you're supposed to protect the church, but it churches doesn't. of our common in America, churches of our common Lord. Right, but, but if but you not, read if you read it carefully, and all those who practice whatever. You know, it goes on to say something like that. I but not, but it's not talking about Islam or Buddhism. Yeah, I believe in the same way to maintain justice, to maintain the peace and protection, to not let mosques be attacked. They need to, they need to protect that, those people too. So they're not, you don't think the civil magistrate has any obligation to protect the church in a distinct way uh, um, over against any other religion? Yeah, I mean, this is, this is what I was making the point with earlier. I got the Buddhist, Buddhist, um, Buddhist temple right here. What what do I want the government, Jared, to do for us, right, that it doesn't do for them in, in terms of, in its main responsibility, I'm not talking about advancing generally morality. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the main responsibility of protecting so that we have an environment to be left free to do our work. Right, but what, like, what, are, what are you asking? Well, if they protect the church, they're protecting truth. If they protect Islam, they're protecting a lie. Again, this, this gets back to Calvin who talks about the moral law of God is that which is in natural law, basically. He says that. And that that is, that is the principles of the way the government, it, it maintains in the second table that we're not lawlessly killing our neighbor, that, that we're not doing those things that are harmful to our neighbor. I want that protected. Yes. But Islam teaches things that are harmful to our neighbor. Right. And that's why I don't want religion in the public sphere. If they're doing things that are against the law, they need to be dealt with. Okay. Yeah, we we need to practice. That's interesting. I, that's good to know. I, that's what kind of I think that is one of the key things. I'm the American version obviously is drastically reduced I think, have from you the looked old at version. Young's article on this? Uh, yeah, I think I read Young's article. You should look at it because But I would he, be I don't I mean I'll read his article. I'd be shocked if it's if it really is a structure that says the American Westminster is actually saying you protect the church just like you protect any other religion. I, I, think, I haven't heard that. I before. think De Young. No, I think to what I'm saying is, is that De Young is promoting there the sort of, you know, co English common law tradition in the sense that they didn't just get this. English common law tradition's been in place a long time. Free democratic principles have been in place a long time outside of Protestant Christianity. I think that's reflected in the 1788 version. And that's because King Alfred was a theonomist. <laughs> <laughs> that's actually, I mean, common law, I don't think the common law wouldn't, I don't think would be on board with the idea of protecting a Buddhist temple or a mosque the way that they protect the church. I'm saying, I'm saying, where, where is the, the 1788? 
Let me I, pull that out. I, this is the original. I don't well, have the seven. This, uh, I've got we, we can follow that rabbit trail, but um, it says there it's providing that for. I wish I had the line. It's just not in my head. Anyways, um, we can put it in the com box after okay, this yeah. and people can talk about it. Right. Um, what I'm not saying, Jared, just so it's clear, because I think I, I, I got a feeling this is going to get misconstrued. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> but I, what I'm not saying is that the government should promote those things that are against the, the moral law of God. Okay. Now right. we can get down to the brass tacks on how we deal with the first table. That's complex. That's complex in our current context. And right. you have shown that. Right. Okay. So you would say that a Muslim should, should, um, what, what about you? He shouldn't be punished for a blasphemy law. Right. Well, there you go. So yeah. I, I, I do believe that, um, in a ideal Christian Republic, there'd be church bells and church spires and no minarets. Okay. But this is make, it kind of answers when I talked and about. So, so the issue is my, my adoption of the American version of the Westminster doesn't mean that I believe that the magistrate should protect churches of our common Lord and persecute the Muslims and the Buddhists. Right. Uh, but I believe that the magistrate needs to be especially solicitous of the Christian, of the churches of our common Lord as representatives of the true religion and should be protective of Buddhist and Muslim lives as uh, individual let, let also, citizens. Let me, also, citizens. let me also say this, that what would I want, Jared? I'd want the majority to be strong believers influence law and government, I think that would be a very healthy situation. I do that's, not. That's what we want. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I, I influence, okay. right? We can talk about what that means. Yeah. Talk about what that means. But I'm very much against, again, the whole Christian nationalist adjective, Christian we, we making don't want Christian. Anyone. We don't want anybody being forced to convert at the point of a spear or the edge of a sword. All right. Was that clear? Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Um, Jared, the kingdoms of this world uh, the kingdoms of our Lord Jesus Christ have become the uh, the kingdoms. Uh, the kingdoms have become the. What does it say? I'm blanking here. Have become uh, the, kingdoms the kingdoms of this of world our... have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ. You say that's past tense. Yes, I heard you say that. That's wrong. <laughs> Man, so, me listen. too. <laughs> me too. Oh no. oh no. That's just that's just blatantly wrong. All right. Um, <laughs> Uh, and then you say, as a con as a follow up to that, that means nothing is off limits. Fundamental ground level restructuring of well everything to pursue a Christendom. Wow. Okay. Uh, on that premise, um, I, I think it's important to say, and this and this gets a little bit to Doug. I'll come to you on this point of what happens at the set. That happens at the seventh trumpet. I never hear anyone raise that point. Now, if you're a full preterist, I realize that's going to be problematic. Right, you're going to believe that happened in eighty seventy or whatever, mm -hmm. but take G. G. K. Beale. God now uh, takes to Himself the rule that He formerly permitted Satan to have over the world. Don't gasp, Doug, because mm -hmm. that's what you said in in Mere Christendom mm -hmm. when Boyd said that. Um, the seventh trumpet, like the seventh seal and the seventh bowl, narrates the very end of history. Um. Already not yet. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so the very end of history, um, the prophetic perfects, past actions from a perspective of the future. That's a, that's a fairly, you know, good scholar there. I want to say with post-millennialism, and I say this, you know, the time is, the timing's all off. So, so, so let me, let me just follow up. The timing's okay. all off. It's a dream. And I'm not seeing it happen. Now, would I love to see it happen? That's not a question. Do I want? We get back to the want thing. I don't. I sure don't see it. it you say it may happen a thousand years down the but road. But how's that not optimistic, Amil? You were talking just a little bit ago about how Jesus is reigning, even though it's chaos all around us. Yeah. Right? In other, it really is already not yet. Yeah. Jesus rose from the dead, and was he ascended into the heavenly places— 2,000 years ago, Daniel 7, right. he was given universal authority over every nation, everything. He was given that dominion. And in Psalm 2, the same thing, um, that you are my son, today I have begotten you, is Acts 13, applies that to the resurrection. So Jesus is the firstborn <laughs> from among the dead. The next verse in Psalm 2 is, ask of me, and I will make the nations your inheritance, right. the ends of the earth your possession. 
So praise God that's happening. Yeah, that, well, that praise that we're we're doing that. So, now. but this is the point. It it's has, happening now. It has happened. It is happening, and it will happen manifestly at the seventh trumpet. Yeah, when when he comes again to judge the living and the dead. Right. So not, it has happened. Not in this grand vision on earth for this no, glory day. God, God has no. We're, we walk by faith, not by sight. Right. So I'm. I'm as a, uh, as a post millennialist. I'm as aware of the fact that the godly are not currently ruling, as you are, and we're both aware that Jesus Christ is on the throne, ruling, currently. He wields the iron rod. That has happened. It is happening, and it will be finally manifested at the end of history. And we'll, right, I and, just say that's at the second coming. Uh, okay, well. At the that's second. the all male position. Well, but, the second, but it's no the second coming. I'm yes, that's right. that is, it's going to be finally manifested at the second coming, and the dead are raised. So um, we we are shooting the admittedly shooting the moon. We we are saying things that go way beyond what anybody can see with their eyes. In some sense, I this is the way I position. There's several angles on this, but I would take. I want to take the big scope, which I know is a post mill thing to do, but the, you know, you think the second Adam comes, he lives a righteous life. He dies on a cross. He rises again three days later. He ascends into heaven, but before doing so saying, go disciple the nations, teach them to observe everything that I've commanded. Lo, I'm with you always sends into heaven, sprinkles the temple with his blood, you know, sends his spirit upon his church. And then the church doesn't fulfill the commission that they just gave them. And I've always thought that's a weird narrative. You know, what, what I think mean? that's what do you a, mean doesn't fulfill? Oh, well go and disciple the nations, teach them to observe all I've commanded, make the world Christian. See, okay. This, will, this is, will that, th will that happen? It's happening, Jared. Yeah. That's the church. Yeah. If it's happening, it's happening. No, if, no, I, we definitely. know what happens in the church. Will it ever happen to the world? Yes. This, this is, this is the holy nation. No, no. A nation well, that tran that transcends and no, all the, the boundaries. Outside, the world that's currently not Christian. Will it ever? All the nations are Christ. That's what you're asking me. Uh, no, uh, and, uh, and, they, 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 and and will bow the knee. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. And so, absolutely. I said but that, that that's a, it's a matter of timing, is what I'm saying. And um, I guess every uh, knee will bow, every tongue confess for blessing. Or, uh, Revelation makes clear that if they don't come into the visible corporate church today, it will be for cursing on yeah, that I, day. Oh, well, yeah, I, I agree with the condition. <laughs> if they don't, then it's for cursing. But will the world ever be overwhelmingly Christian? Well, again, I, I don't. I don't think post. Okay, I don't think the scriptures give us a blueprint for mapping that out and make that case. It's kind of like the Romans eleven thing. Will Will the Jews come yeah. in? Right. Um, there's a lot of debate about that. Could God do that? Sure. Yeah. But I don't. I don't. I, I think there's a reason, Doug and Jared. That's not the emphasis in Scripture. The emphasis is imminent coming. Go out, preach the gospel. You leave the saving to me. Uh, everyone is being put under the feet right now. Out of all the people groups, the promise to Abraham is being realized right now. Like when he said. In you, all the nations will be blessed. Acts 28 is simply telling us that the people groups, the Gentiles, will come in. And that's the, for, the very program that begins in mm -hmm. Acts 1, where it's Judea and Jerusalem to the Jerusalem, Judea to the ends of the earth. Um, you know, it's the 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 concern about the post-mill grand vision is again what I've said, it still holds out something of Christ's kingdom. That has not that is not glorious in the moment to me. This is absolutely glorious in the sense of, you know, here mm. I am, blue state. I come every week. I'm preaching to the nations. Everything I'm coming. I'm, pre I'm preaching to the nations every week. So I want to say it's glorious. Uh, that's why when you've said this every time, I just want to amen it. It's glorious and it's here and it's realized. You're you're using that kind of sentiment, and I just want to say and it grows. Sure. It, so it's glorious and it grows. Another word, another angle would be in Matthew 28 when Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. I can't help but read that in light of what the devil was just tempting him with, right? In the wilderness, here are all the kingdoms of the earth. And Jesus says, no, I'm not going to bow down to you and take them. I'm going to take them through the cross, through the way of suffering, as you mentioned. Yeah. And then he rises from the dead and says, all authority in heaven and on earth 
heaven and on earth has been given to me. Yeah. So I think the way someone's speaking about that, like when did Christ get that, that particular authority that he's talking about in Matthew 28, that authority on earth, when did, when did, when was that given to Christ? And we want to say, of course, in one sense, he's a second member of the Trinity. He's always had authority. But in this particular sense, he's speaking as the second Adam, the resurrected son of man. And he's saying that which the devil tried to tempt me with, which he should have never tempted me with, but indeed yeah. they were his possession at the time. They're not his possession well, anymore. Well, this is, this is why we should celebrate Ascension Day. So, so, um, so but the, there's an important point here. Everything I've heard you affirm about your optimistic Amil position, uh, there's nothing there that we don't also have and that we don't also affirm. There are things that we're affirming that go beyond that that you don't think it's that's quite all that. <laughs> But yeah, I think I think okay. Let me raise my concern then. Okay, I'll show you what 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 I do think's lacking. Okay. I'm going to read a quote by Gerhardus Voss. A religion that has ceased to set its face toward the celestial city is bound sooner or later to discard all also all supernatural resources in its endeavor to transform this present world. The days are perhaps far distant when we shall find ourselves confronted with a quasi-form of Christianity professing openly to place its dependence on and to work for the present life alone, a religion, to use the language of Hebrews, become profane and fornicator like Esau, selling for a mess of earthly pottage its heavenly birthright. There's my concern, Doug, right there. Let me, let me just comment more. on it. That, that, that another religion... Amen, is amen. being imposed upon us that is so earthly minded it's taken us off the the heavenly city and well here here's my here's my great burden here's my great burden nobody's talking about hell nobody fears hell anymore nobody's talking about judgment nobody's talking about people are going to face the wrath. We've got James White saying the greatest enemy, the greatest thing I could ever conceive of is the secular state. No, my friend, the greatest danger is the hell and wrath and judgment of God. We're off that right now. So Voss predicted a time when we would be so sidetracked to transform this world that we pulled people away from the true and most important yeah, but need for people. But here's the that's that's I, it. That's I, it. I feel like Paul coming to Jerusalem, <coughs> who's exhorted to remember the poor, which was the very thing he had come with an offering to do. Um, so Voss, it, what Voss says there fits like a glove if you're talking about the mainline denominations and the social gospel and early 20th century. Well, that's probably what he was reacting to then. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But, but I, there's 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 a two sides of the same coin oh, yeah, here. No, but no. <laughs> Christian nationalism and social uh, except that wokeism. You know. Except that um, in Moscow, and I'm at least one of the representatives of what Christian nationalism wants to be. There are competing definitions and stuff, but we, are, we have a, a community where we've been test driving it for decades. We worship the Lord weekly. We are, we are biblical absolutists. We believe in the in the plenary inspiration of Scripture, we believe in the vicarious substitutionary death of Christ on the cross for sinners, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension, and his return in power and glory, which we preach. We disciple our, uh, disciple our kids in terms of that. The kids are working through the historic Reformed catechisms. We, it's a joyful community. It's all, all the things that the social liberals weren't, social gospel liberals weren't, we are we are pursuing the worship of God in the name of Jesus Christ as the driving engine of all of this. Okay, it, I, it, I, and I I would I get, say I get that, but let me just on. This is this is why. Please your buy writings, my book. Please <laughs> buy my book. <laughs> I have it. It's marked up, by the way. You, it's the writings and the, and what I'm seeing that's driving the vitriol of this movement. That's not if that's all true. Okay. Uh, but the so, conclusion, the, the, sh the, sh the sharing of that vision. Now you talk in here, fair. Uh, to be fair, to yeah. be fair, you talk in here about a hot gospel. I'd like to come yeah. to that, yeah. um, and and that's important. But I guess we got to talk about getting the gospel right. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I do want to. I do want right. to. I want to underscore one thing because you you uh, this has come up a few times, right? And it's like you're. I think Chris, you're right to see 
that there are that Voss quote is perfect. I mean, swish from the three point line. It's just I, I agree with every single word of it. What what is going on in Moscow that really does need to get out? Because what you're worried about is a problem. I think I just don't. I I think Moscow actually has a particular. Um, help for that problem and in particular it's covenant renewal worship it's it's a it's a worldview it's a way of coming saying basically on the sabbath yeah. as we rest from our labors and we look to the lord and we say please god bring the fire that's the day that we believe there's most advance the, the greatest advancements of the kingdom of god on earth are on that day it's a very elijah on mount carmel kind of thing but I, pour water on the sacrifice and god sends the fire but i do think we should get to getting the gospel right because i think a lot of people will be disappointed if we yeah. didn't get to that. So, so the state or, orders horizontally relationships between the Lord. That's what I wanted to say to you earlier. I had that note and then I forgot it. But that, that's what I think is one of the primary responsibilities of the state. Psalm 82. Okay. Um, getting the gospel right. So that's what you, you talked about on Tucker, a hot gospel. Um, we talked about Paul. By the way, there's one other verse I want to to read to you guys. Um, when I think about Paul, and um, this is the pro. Oh, this is this I thought was a really good capture of government responsibility. Just to follow up, so I don't leave it. Gallio said to them, "If you Jews were making a complaint about some misdemeanor or serious crime, it would be reasonable for me to listen to you. But since it involves questions about words and names and your own law." Settle the matter yourselves. I will not be a judge of such things. It seems to me that captures well the position of government to answer your question. Um, that's inspired. Take a general equity kind of principle. <laughs> so I, I think that's helpful. Um, anyways, I don't want to open that up again. So. All right. Okay. Doug, Doug looked like you wanted to go after it. So, all right. We won't spend time on two kingdoms. So okay. I think we actually have already. Yeah, I have. I, I wanted to answer your five questions in your book, but okay. you know what? We'll do it another time. All right. So, um, all right. Federal Vision. It, it seemed to me that mere uh, Christendom appears to be kind of a federal vision for governments in some way. Now, I don't know if you ever heard that critique, but mm -mm. I'm thinking through that. Um, personal reflection. Seven NAPARC reports um, can really had serious condemning reports and statements about this theology of federal vision. Mm -hmm. um, I've heard you, I've heard you on numerous programs, Doug, laugh, <coughs> basically laugh down the reports. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I saw this movement now, keep in mind, I was on the committee that wrote the FV report for the URCNA. Okay. Okay. Years ago. 2007 or 8. I saw this rip apart churches, uh, creating some of the ugliest fights and separations I've seen. I was a young minister at the time. Mm -hmm. People were confused. If our doctrine is supposed to create the unity of the faith and the bond of peace, this absolutely ravished the reform world. Justification's a big deal. Right. This was at the heart of the controversy. Seminaries condemned it. Um, Mid-America Reform Seminary wrote a testimony of the recent errors. Um, ARP, these, these views are in conflict with the teaching of Scripture, and as such, they are unacceptable. OPC, FV is out of accord with Scripture and our doctrinal standards. URC, by the standards of biblical and confessional teaching, this reformulation of the doctrine of justification by FV writers stands condemned. Sproul, I can't fathom why there's any hesitancy about rejecting federal vision he was talking about when he stood on the PCA floor. There's too much at stake. This is the gospel we're talking about. Okay, these mm -hmm. aren't lightweights. Right. Um, this is NAPARC. I don't know how many churches are represented in NAPARC. I don't know what the population of that is. The whole Reformed world, at least of NAPARC, of all the confessionally Reformed churches condemned these teachings as erroneous. Does that bother you at all? Yeah, but yes, it does. But let me tell you what part of it bothers me. I agreed with 95% of their condemnations. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, you've agreed with 95% of me today, well, but we got to get to the core like no, issue there's, here, there's right? The, the, well, the, 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 the presenting issue, uh, the one place where I think there was actual, genuine, substantive disagreement that was understood by both parties was on child communion. Pedo com communion is not a trifle. It's 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 a significant departure from the um, from what most of the reformed musculus held to it, but uh, most of the reformed were not on board with it. That that's an issue, and it's not a trivial issue. But when it comes to justification by faith alone, uh, opposition to sacrament sacramental juju, uh, all of those things, when uh, th and these these statements from all these churches did not mention my name. They didn't say Wilson teaches and Wilson is to be condemned. And then when I read through the statements and I say, amen, 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 amen. Okay, child communion, I differ there. And amen, amen. Um, well, don't you think, though, Doug, that they were, we always heard it wasn't a monolithic movement. I mean, I just, that's still banged in my head from 2007. Don't you think that the churches understood it to be? And so they, they were going after the movement of which your writers contribute they, they, they and should, your signing of the document? They should name somebody. They should condemn somebody. And the only, <laughs> the only people that were ever brought up on charges, like Lightheart was, um, was vindicated. Lightheart was vindicated by the PCA, one of the, one of the bodies that condemned this theology. Um, vindicated Peter Lightheart, who's one of the oatmeal stouts in, in the movement. So why then start the CRC? What, if it... Well, the CRC started before all this, um, and it, I, I can give you the... the um, okay, Doug, the, I, I get the point. I'll, I'll give I you the, the elevator pitch. Well, for, it's, it's all right. Um, the, the CRC started first, and it was because baptism was the issue. I was the pastor of a Baptistic church. I became a Pado baptist Long story short, it caused a ruckus. The, um, there was a massive heads of household meeting. The men in our congregation told the Baptist leadership and the Pado baptist leadership, we want you to work it out, which we did. And because we worked it out, we had a baptismal cooperation agreement, which kept us from joining like the PCA. We went to a PCA uh, presbytery meeting, but we had the, it was the Groucho Marx thing. I, I wouldn't join a club that would have me. So I didn't want to dilute a pedo baptistic Presbyterian church with the mutt arrangement that we had. So that's why the CREC started historically. Then later on, the Federal Vision thing erupted. And in that controversy, consistently from day one, I was articulating what I called the amber ale version of Federal Vision over against the oatmeal stouts. I understand. I remember. Right. Yeah. Then in the Federal Vision joint statement— all the really prob the problematic issues were in the postscript. So there was a consensus document that everybody could sign, including me. Well, uh, I don't know about that, but I, there were problems all throughout that document. Well, problem things that you could disagree with because it was post mill, and there were other things. <laughs> no, but well, there was there was. I'll come to that. Okay, the, basically, there is um, just a, a sinner's just justification is punctiliar. It happens at a moment in time. The sole instrument of a sinner's justification is faith, which God himself gives, lest any man should boast. Okay, so before, before we get into that issue, let, let, me, let me appeal. Everyone, I don't know how many podcasts you've done on this issue, how many times you've had to defend yourself over and over and over. Right. You know, I've been, I've been a pastor 20 years. You've been in a long time. In 20 years, not one person has ever come up and challenged my view of justification by grace through faith alone. Mm -hmm. If one person had, mm -hmm. and one person had gotten in my face and said, you, you abused the doctrine, you got it wrong, could have been, we talk about the doctrinal test, I know, yeah. what you, I know your whole point on that. Um, nobody believes that, but Sproul said that. My point is, okay, I, I may have been sloppy in the sermon. Yeah. I, I may not have been clear. You know, we give, we give pastors mm -hmm. that kind of charity. Yeah. Um, on your first point, yes, you weren't mentioned, um, but that doesn't, that doesn't release you or remove you from the legitimate critiques because we have your writings on the issue. 
Yeah, uh, okay. which I point to. Okay. So I, I don't know why that is the overarching argument here up front, but I, fair enough. If you wanted to be directly called out, maybe it should have been done. I, I don't know what to say about that other than I don't, I don't think it, it negates what the issue is. But No, when you condemn Nestori- Nestorianism, they named Nestorius. When you condemn Pelagianism— Did you want it, did you want it to be called Wilsonian— No, I— I, what I want, Wilsonianism? I, what you no, what I want called? is if, if I want to be condemned by an ecclesiastical body or a synod, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm to suffer the condemnation, they should at least have the decency to name Okay, name but Doug, me. don't you think that there were so many shades in this movement, a variety of writers saying, oh, Lusk, oh, Schlichel, were saying things that were just so bad, heretical, I feel, um, that— you know, to pin down one or two to do that, that, you even mentioned the distinction that it wouldn't have been the most helpful thing. There was enough to know who was writing it and where. We had books published on it. Yeah. So, so the point is— So to, name, to, them, name them. Okay. Well, whatever the case, whatever the case, I, don't, I think that's a bit of a red herring. The issue before us is the writings and the teachings. Let me start with this. Okay. If one saith that justifying faith is nothing— else but confidence in the divine mercy, which remits sins for Christ's sake, or that this confidence alone is that whereby we are justified, let him be anathema. Trent, Canon 12. So Rome, in the act of justification, faith consists not merely of trusting in Christ to save, but faith uh, that in, uh, justifies includes the inward habits, mm-hmm. righteousness, hope, charity, other virtues. Okay. I'm just going to read a couple comments here. I'm going to let you comment. We're not going to spend a lot of time on this because yeah. I don't have it. I mean, we got to, we, yeah. you have to go here shortly. But Calvin, for did faith justify of itself or as it is expressed in its own intrinsic virtue, as it is always weak and imperfect, its efficacy would be partial and thus our righteousness be maim, being maimed would give us only a portion of salvation. We indeed imagine nothing of the kind, but say that properly speaking, God alone justifies the same thing we likewise transfer to Christ because he was given to us for righteousness while we compare faith to a kind of vessel because we are incapable of receiving Christ unless we are emptied and come with an open mouth to receive his grace. Perkins, the hand always has a property to reach out itself, to lay hold of anything and to receive a gift, but the hand has no property to cut a piece of wood itself without a saw or knife or some like instrument. Even so, it is the nature of faith to go out of itself and receive Christ into the heart. And for the duties of the first and second table, faith cannot itself bring them forth no more than the hand can divide or cut. I have more, but I'm going to go get to the point here. I'm going to read one thing you said, just because I think it captures it. Read a few statements, have you respond, okay? In his parabolic polemic against Westminster Seminary, okay, this was years ago. Once two seminary professors at Westminster Theological Seminary were walking together, heads bowed as they were deep in theological conversation. (coughs) Their topic concerned the depths of the wisdom of God and the salvation of sinful man. It was... Consequently, slow going, as though they were trying to paddle a canoe across a lake of chocolate pudding. The point of their discussion was to ascertain whether the faith represented by the phrase sola fide was living faith or dead faith. So that must have been Horton and Clark you were thinking of there, right? Okay, I don't, okay. re- I don't remember. All right. For it seemed clear to them, as well as to you and me, that it had to be one or the other. But to be frank, a celebration of dead faith did not seem to them to be quite in keeping with the spirit of the Reformation. Not only that, but the folks down at the marketing and PR had positively nixed any such phrase for use on the donor's brochure, but the alternative was no better. To use the phrase living faith made them sound like Norman Shepard. As they wrestled with the problem, slowly the light dawned on them at once. In order to be alone, as in faith alone, the faith of our fathers could be neither living or dead, But borrowing a phrase from chemistry, it had to be inert. It had to be colorless and odorless, like argon. And like Martin Luther, there they stood. Okay, so shepherd's thrown in there, so you have this option. Notice Perkins, 
Um, there's no property of faith. The hand has no property to reach out itself to lay hold of anything and to receive a gift, but the hand hath no property to cut the piece of wood itself without saw or knife or some other instrument. Even so, the nature of faith is to go outside of itself. Here you were, you know, whatever the, the problems were between Escondido and Moscow or whatever, here are, here are men holding to the confessional categories of the nature of justifying faith. And you're, 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 you're saying to them, you're saying to them, you are criticizing their very doctrine of faith. Mm-hmm. Okay. So the faith then that you present— Because it was not confessional. Okay. Well, this is, gets, gets to an issue. The faith that you propose is this. Thank you for being honest about that. Um, I'm treating obedient faith and living faith as synonymous. It is obedient in this life. And that living condition, it is, uh, and in that living condition, it is the instrument of our justification. Obedient faith is the only kind God ever gives. And when he gives it, this justifying faith obeys the gospel, obeys the truth, obeys his salvation. Faith that does not obey the gospel is not justifying faith. By obedience, in the phrase um, obedient faith, I'm not referring to any of the doing that proceeds out of this being. I'm treating obedient faith and living faith as synonymous. Neither can there be living faith that gives rise to all these actions. Uh, I'm sorry. Neither can the living faith that gives rise to all these actions be the ground of our justification. But it is obedient in its life. And in that living condition, it is the instrument of our justification. That is such a muddled mess, building into the nature of justifying faith those very virtues that Romans, I mean, that Trent, they understood the Protestant doctrine right. You would have to criticize the Protestant doctrine. And and as I'm hearing you here, Doug, you're doing the very thing of building building into the nature of justifying faith works. You're sweeping it together. No, because I deny that it's the habits that Trent uses the the language of internalized habits. I deny that it's the only obedience that is rendered is God says live, and it does. That's it. And the the Westminster Confession. Uh, let's see. It's uh, I wrote it down here. Uh, no dead faith. Westminster Confession eleven point two. I'm I'm uh, I'm simply saying that living faith is the only faith that God gives. But that's not what you simply said elsewhere. Well, no, it, that's, that's what I hold, what I've held from the very beginning. So if you took the Calvin quote and the Perkins quote and gave it to me on a sheet of paper, I would sign both of them in blood. And that, and that was the best mints or best view. No, no, I would sign both of Calvin and Perkins in blood. The issue is, live, it does. By the way, I don't like that name, Best Spencer Best. So, okay. <laughs> well, I was horsing around. I know you were. I know. I'm just saying. I, I don't. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Respect so, all senators. <laughs> uh, so, in Westminster Confession 11.2, it says that the faith, that justifying faith is no dead faith. That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying there's, there's not a nanosecond, there's not an obedience after the. Basically, what does obedient faith do? It rests and receives. That's the only thing it does. Okay. So, and according uh, to the confession, works by love. Right. Okay. It's no dead faith, but worketh by love. That's, that's a, 11 that's a but, yeah, but correct. But, and, but the, and the, the, I, my point is, I agree with you here. Okay. I, I know, Doug, but that's not what you said elsewhere. So, you know, well, take the Arnson interview. I, I You know, um, but, Doug, when you cite continuing goodness in Romans 11 in your 2012 lecture, is that the cause of our salvation or continuing goodness the fruit is san- of it? Continuing goodness is sanctification. Okay, period. but you said yes. <laughs> so, uh, Doug, you just said there, inherently ambiguous, you wouldn't give a clear answer to that basic question. Is is continuing goodness the cause of our salvation or the fruit of it? Yes, and everyone laughs. Don't, don't you think that's the kind of stuff, and this is where I get back to appealing maybe to your conscience a little bit, if I can, that, that my friend, it, it troubled us so greatly. Like, I, it troubled us so greatly 
what it did to pastors, what it did to churches, the untold damage of this stuff. And, and I can go through here. I, I don't know if it's helpful. I think you've been through this a million times. Uh, we've been going three hours. I guess what I'm saying is I can go through Lusk. I can go through Schlichel, who yelled at Otis, basically, saying that Abraham was justified by obedience. And you, you basically said, no, he, you know, it, um, he's not saying that. And, and, and so you haven't separated yourself from these men who've taught these very so, erroneous things. So here, here there's very important things to say. One is that when I wrote in 2017, my blog post, Federal Vision, No Moss, I went through a bunch of these things. And I also addressed, there was a, a, a place where I wanted to clarify the record. I also wanted to seek forgiveness for certain things, which I laid out in that uh, blog post. We, uh, a cafeteria food fight erupted and I was just, I just went to a federal vision conference. Uh, we weren't starting a movement or anything. This uproar, I, 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 uproar I, I, started yeah. and what, not by us. And we were, it, and it started by us being excommunicated. May God have mercy on our souls. Um, excommunicated by a body of people that we weren't, it didn't have any attachment to. So the, basically the the whole thing got off in a nasty way on the wrong foot. But I believe that I <coughs> contributed to the problems in some, in certain ways that I specify, okay. that okay. I, that I specify in that blog post. That's so one. FV no moss, FV no moss. But, 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 I also, okay, I also wrote an entire book against the church, which was aimed at the concerns that I had on our side of the aisle. Right, right. So I, I wrote, Reformed is Not Enough, which was part of the initial uh, federal vision thing. And then uh, in the joint joint uh, statement, I we separated out the problems that I thought were problematic, where we differed among ourselves. Then in the federal vision, no moss, I, I carefully went through the whole thing and owned everything I thought I could in good conscience own. And I've spent a lot of time trying to lean against what I, uh, what I consider to be a, a, an erosion of um, uh, Reformed orthodoxy. I don't call any of my friends heretics, but I do believe that at certain points they're not confessional. Right. Okay. Um, so, and and I'm very clear about all of that in these in these books, and w part of the disruption, uh, a, and a big part of the disruption has to be owned by the churches that were harmed in the way that you're talking. Uh, I I didn't launch a crusade against anybody. I was just defending the movement. Did well. The movement did well. No, the and, the, the, and, the first the 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 first volleys. The the heretic bombing the the heretic bombing was all incoming. We we weren't do, um Well, I mean, I mean, okay. I'm just gonna read two more statements. I'm done with this because I don't sure. we don't have time. But right. just to give you an example of how abrasive, contrary to Reformed confessions, even heretical, some of these statements are. I mean, this is this is less. The initial clothing in white is received by faith alone. This is the beginning of Joshua's justification. But if Joshua is to remain justified, that is, if the garments that he has received are not to become resoiled with his iniquity, he must be faithful. Thus, initial justification is by faith alone. Subsequent, just, subsequent justifications include obedience. What in the world is that? And then, you know, uh, especially when, you know, we talk about active obedience, which... <sighs> you know, poor Machen, you know, you, the, the statement actually denied the act of obedience. And Lust says justification requires no transfer or imputation of anything. It does not force us to reify righteousness into something that can be shuffled around in heavenly accounting books. Rather, I am in the righteous one and in, uh, in the I am vindicated one, I am righteous and vindicated. My Christness makes imputation redundant. I do not need the moral content of the life of Christ transferred to me. Okay, these kind of statements that you were joined with in that federal vision statement, um, set off the world <laughs> well, of the reform world. There's, there's several things. One, those statements that Rich made, I did not make and would not make. So, so do you condemn those statements? Uh, well, I disagree with those. Do you statements. think they're heretical? No, I think they're non-confessional. Okay. So you think to deny the act of obedience of Christ and to build into that 
dual justifications on our works at the last day is simply not confessional, that that's not a denial of the Christian so gospel. That's not a Judaizing the, thing. Some of the men who attend, some of the delegates to the Westminster Confession denied the imputation of the act of obedience to Christ. Yeah, but they didn't do what lust did here. No, my, my point is, I affirm the imputation of the act of obedience of Christ. I have affirmed it from the very beginning. I've affirmed it over and over and over. And I can't get people, I, for love or money, I can't get people to say, yes, Wilson affirms the imputation no, I, I, of the I, act of obedience of Christ. I guess what, I guess what we're concerned about is the, the muddledness around all your friends in refusing to... The Effie Nomos paper was confusing to me. It seemed to say, I reject the title, but not the teachings. Um, that There's was confusing a, to but me. But there was a big... Uh, no, I reject the title, but not the things I affirmed in the first part. But there's a long section where I talked about the things I did wrong and the things I sought forgiveness for. Okay. Right. Um, but, so, but here, let me let me just read this, and and then I this this really grieves me. Okay. I, I I do not I do not enjoy this at all. Um, I find this to be you know very yeah. very burdensome. Right. And you know it's not my it's not my goal to take down Doug Wilson. Uh, no, no. I, I I you know my 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 goal is sincerely the the truth of the gospel. And my concern for what it's done to the sheep, and just the un, the lack of clarity. And there's one statement that I think summarizes the, the final thing we'll close on, um, if I can find it here. It's this. This is DeYoung. Wilson excels at the Mountain Bailey approach, makes an outrageous statement that fires up the internet. And then when pressed, retreats to a milder version of the same statement, all without ever giving up on the original statement. Um, I think, Doug, many of us feel that that's the slipperiness that we've had to, to address with you. And Could you show an example? Well, an example would I just probably... did. I just did. Oh, you want, I'll give you more if you want to go through No, them. no. The example would be the uh, statement where I said yes and everybody laughed. Yeah, I mean, that's a okay. great one. Okay, that would be an example. But I would be interested, very interested to see what I said after the after the laugh, because I, I don't see that as, here's the outrageous thing, and then I walk it back. It's, I say the thing, and then I explain what I said. Okay. Well, I just went through the war on this. I've seen the damage, and the thing hasn't gone away. And then you got a new generation rising up. <laughs> you know? What's the red pill? You know, these young guys who, ignorant of the controversies, think that the whole reform world has blown this out of proportion. You're on there, and you're not making clear to them these dangers, in my opinion. How many I, books How many books do I have to write? And I'd like to this, underscore, I'd like to underscore, he, uh, active obedience of Christ, thoroughly underscored, having a righteousness not my own, thoroughly underscored. Three cheers and amen for the active obedience of Christ. Let me just say that I care about both of you, well, and um, I'm I'm very grateful that you guys came out, well, and I I will pray for you earnestly, and I just want you to know that I I care about you, and um, like I said at the beginning, even if I considered someone an enemy, I'm called to love them. Well, let let us say how much we appreciate both your invitation to come here and do this, and the entire way you've treated us